Hello. Hi, good afternoon. Boa tarde, buenas tardes. Welcome everyone to El Museo del Barrio's virtual space this afternoon and to our symposium, Identity Reimagine, Reframing La Colección. Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you to Dynamics Multilingual Services who will be providing interpretation for today's symposium. If you would like interpretation, uh, please look for the round globe that says interpretation and select Spanish interpretation. If you are on a phone, please click on the three dots and select interpretation from uh, there. Uh, this afternoon, this Sunday afternoon in Manhattan, I greet you from my home in East Harlem, El Barrio. And before anything, I'm, uh, I li would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land of the indigenous uh, people where we are located today, the land of the Lenape people, and the genocidal colonial past that involves their history and this land and their removal from it. Also, Allow me please to express our solidarity to the esteemed invited speakers who could not be with us today due to personal emergencies. We are sending our best wishes. Since 2020, El Museo del Barrio has been working on its most ambitious collection initiative to date. Under the umbrella title, Identity Reimagine, Reframing La Colección, this initiative is the result of a renewed curatorial interest in reevaluate the 8,000 plus objects in the institutional's permanent collection, its histories and futurities, bringing new interpretative perspectives to its intrinsic diversity, relevance, and complexity. At the same time, opening up new paths of possibilities for new generations of museum goers. At a moment when institutions around the world reconsider their collecting practices in the light of their colonial ties, it is no surprise to notice El Museo del Barrio's pioneering role as an institution, as, as an institution deeply rooted in community, artistic vision, and anti-colonization, anti-racist values. With this thought in mind, we have embarked on a new, exciting, and thought-provoking recategorization of our holdings, seeking to advance scholarship in the fields of Puerto Rican, Latinx, Caribbean, and Latin American art in the United States. These efforts have been initially implemented through the general support of the Reenvisioning Permanent Collections grants, grant given by the Terra Foundation for American Art in 2021. Under this innovative framework, we were able to convene six think tank sessions, bringing together scholars, independent researchers, curators, artists, community leaders to discuss our permanent collection. We use six new categories, African and indigenous heritage, craft intersection, graphics expanded, representing Latinx, urban experiences, and women artists to critically rethink how the collection can be discussed and presented. Next year, they will serve as the basis for a new exhibition that will look deeply on how each of these notions have shaped the collection over the decades. The last time an initiative with a similar scope and ambition was organized was with the Voces y Visiones highlighting the Museo de Barrios collection, exhibitions and publications back in 2003, 2004. Also thanks to a collection care grant given by the Andrew W. Milan Foundation, our registers have been doing important work in collection storage and conservation. And I like to express the importance of their work to this project and share a big thank you to Daniel Silva, register, and Michelle McVickler, a, perm a permanent collection associate register. Thanks also to this grant, we have been able to have our associate collection curator, a newly created position, Lee Sessions, collaborating with us in this project. Today's program is a continuation of our conversations around the permanent collection. And I'd like to thank our speakers for being here with us. Following my initial remarks, curator Susanna Tamkin, who's here with me and is the co-organizer of the collection initiative and the exhibition next year with me, 
we'll present a historical overview on different collection exhibitions at the museum since its foundation in 1969. We are also very happy to have our colleague, Adriana Zavala, as featured spotlight speaker, presenting, presenting on Latinx presence in institutional collections across the United States. Our panel discussion with researchers Abigail Laponda Ardashti, Sarda Yalkin, and Melissa Ramos as speakers will focus on New York, New York and Puerto Rican histories and stories, their graphic and photographic images and networks, their vanguards and afterlives. Finally, we are honored to have artist Pepon Osorio as our uh, keynote finalizing the session. So I wish everybody like a wonderful symposium and I turn to uh, my colleague, Susanna Tamkin, who's gonna present. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rodrigo. Um, as Rodrigo mentioned, we are embarking um, and have already been thinking about ways to re-envision El Museo del Barrio's permanent collection, which has really been a collection in formation for over 50 years since El Museo was initially founded by Rafael Montañez Ortiz in 1969. Um, in the next 10 or so minutes, I'm gonna offer just some very brief, um, a brief historiography of the collection uh, drawn mostly from the archives at El Museo del Barrio. Um, and I offer this as just a first look um, at some of the research that the curatorial team, um, as well as outside scholars are, um, are engaging with as part of this larger collection. And also to acknowledge that what I'll be presenting to you all is focused mainly on um, the documentary aspects in relation to key exhibition, um, key exhibitions at El Museo. And it doesn't acknowledge the very important contributions of specific donors or foundations, such as El Museo's various acquisitions committees over the years, or the um, Jacques and Natalia Gelman Pro Artista Fund, which you know, is another um, mode of research that I hope we are able to continue to make as we continue forth on this project. Um, what you're seeing here on the screen, of course, dates to the very beginnings of El Museo, as I mentioned in 1969, with the conception and foundation of El Museo um, under uh, the, the idea of Rafael Montañez Ortiz. And as this New York Times article um, on the left of your screen states, not that you can read the tiny print, but in the article, the writer states that um, El Museo del Barrio, the, first, the city's first museum of Puerto Rican culture has no building, no collection, no guards. And I think this emphasis on not having a collection in 1969 um, is really turned around quite quickly. And despite um, Raphael's very flexible, very fluid conception for what the museum could become, I found it very intriguing that right from the start in this um, document that was recently on view in Rodrigo's and um, Julieta Gonzalez's monographic ex exhibition, that Raphael, in fact, was outla outlining his desires for a collection. Um, saying that, quote, as you can all read, the acquiring of a permanent collection of pre-conquest and pre-post-conquest art objects, not art resulting from American influences and all folk arts was something that he was really interested in, um, in developing right from the very start. Following um, Montañez Ortiz's tenure and under the directorship of Marta Moreno Vega, uh, for me, it's very interesting to see how a continued yet somewhat nuanced approach to what collecting um, should and could look like at El Museo, how that developed, um, particularly in line with her emphasis on the daily life of um, Puerto Ricans in New York. So quoting from uh, one of her essays written in El Museo's bilingual quarterly, Kimbamba, uh, Moreno Vega writes, 
quote, the utilization of our products as part of our lives is in direct conflict with the aesthetics which promote the glorification of art by setting it up on a far off pedestal. It would be unfortunate if our parents stopped producing needlework for their young in order that the objects be treasured and isolated in museums. The objective is not to house our or collect objects, but to make our children aware of the historical and present significance of the Puerto Rican aesthetic. So again, I found that um, very compelling to think about how Dr. Uh, Marta Moreno Vega was really nuancing how um, some of the objects that would ultimately end up in a place like El Museo, what a collection um, at our institution means um, as compared to a mainstream art museum. And on view, you're seeing, this is a photograph from an early brochure taken um, by uh, another esteemed and former director, Hiram Maristani. Uh, and this is an image from within the museum, noting um, the educational values of the collections on display. And I'm highlighting here this work that we see on the walls that um, continues to be in El Museo's collection to this day. And this moment, these early donations really correspond to a period of um, really intense generosity um, that I, we have uh, noticed from not only local collectors and donors, but from artists themselves, including some of um, the very earliest donations uh, to El Museo. So on view, um, this is a bilingual press release that was issued in 1971. Um, I find it really compelling that El Museo, uh, you know, this was obviously a momentous uh, incident. Uh, the donation of the portfolio by the Centro de Arte Puerto Riqueño to the collection that was announced um, not just in English but in Spanish in keeping with the bilingual emphasis of uh, El Museo del Barrio at the time. And again, this was a portfolio of um, some 12 objects from the Centro de Arte Puerto Riqueño, um, including the much beloved uh, woodcut by, um, by Rafael Tufino, again, current, still in our collection, of course. Uh, and again, this generosity, of course, it continues to this day, but another really important historical moment um, was the 1976 donation from uh, the New Rican Collective and Foco to El Museo del Barrio of the, um, of the print collection, the New York Puerto Rican Experience, which was recently on view at El Museo. So again, an early testament to the growth of the collection. The next major inflection point um, that we have observed takes place under the tenure of Jack Agueros under his directorship and really coincides with the move of, the, of El Museo to the Heckscher building, our current collection, our current location. Uh, under Agueros' tenure, there were a number of exhibitions that were really focused on highlighting the recent donations that were being made, um, including this 1978 show that was featuring 27 paintings and sculptures all acquired, um, you know, right at that moment. The introduction that Agueros makes in this catalog is very revealing as well, because he takes note um, that at the time in 1978, El Museo had 70 paintings and sculptures in its collection, alongside some 600 or more works on paper, which he describes as being, quote, a collection that, albeit small, becomes one of the most important Latin art resources north of, of um, San Juan. Uh, this collection exhibition is also incredibly interesting from a historical viewpoint for the fact that a number three artists were invited to reflect on the collection at the time, um, one of whom was Jorge Soto Sanchez, whose work El Gobernador um, that you see at the top of the screen was included among the recent selections. And um, I must say that uh, Jorge Soto Sanchez really does not parse his words. Um, he says that while he feels that El Museo at this moment is institutionalizing himself, he really takes El Museo to task and talks about the missing names um, that are not yet present. 
And to quote his final words from the um, essay, he says, it is time that we start to deal more consciously and qualitatively with the permanent collection. And that's something that um, it's interesting to be traced uh, as Jack Agueros' tenure continues. Um, this is an exhibition held some four years later for the new East Wing Gallery and additional recent acquisitions exhibition. Um, and uh, this exhibition not only celebrated the expansion of El Museo and the establishment of a number of galleries dedicated to particular um, collection focuses, including a video gallery, a theater gallery, the Ricardo Alegria Gallery of Caribbean Pre-Columbian Art, which in fact included a waterfall and a pool that was described as, quote, subtropical, green and moist, and sounds like a nightmare from a curatorial perspective today. Um, but also included some of those very same acquisitions that Jorge Soto Sanchez was calling for. Um, so these are two acquisitions corresponding to that moment, Papo Colo's um, Artefacto para Guardar Secretos, and of course this um, Marcos Dimas painting recently on view in the Taller Boricua show, Marcos being one of the artists that Jorge Soto Sanchez specifically um, cited as a glaring, a glaring, um, uh, gap in the collection at the time. And this is also an interesting uh, acquisitions um, exhibition for my eyes because it also includes artists who are um, from beyond the Puerto Rican diaspora, including an artist like um, Luis Cruz Azaceta and his um, local local painting of the subway. Um, moving forward in our flash through El Museo's collections history, um, for a, another major inflection point, of course, takes place um, under at the 25th anniversary mark uh, that took place from 1994-1995 under the directorship of Susana Torrela Leval, a three-part over one year exhibition, which um, I believe will have a number of nuances and that Rodrigo and I see um, a number of sources of inspirations for in our current project. And for this uh, series of exhibitions, um, Susana and the curatorial team at the time invited contemporary living artists to reflect and engage on El Museo's permanent collection. Again, another testament, um, as we saw previously with the Jorge Soto Sanchez quote, of how um, vital the artist community is when it comes to um, the development, the engagement, the interpretation of the permanent collection. And that project really laid what I see as groundwork for um, El Museo's truly major undertaking really begun in uh, the early 2000s, the Voces y Visiones program, which uh, included a number of different facets, much like our, um, our own project today, including um, some early brochures, a major touring exhibition, a series of exhibitions, um, smaller scale exhibitions held on site throughout the following decade, and um, very importantly for scholarship, um, the, the only um, dedicated publication uh, of El Museo del Barrio's collection. So for those of you who um, have not seen this uh, collector's object at this point, unfortunately, many of these publications are now out of print. Um, this is a multi-volume, slim volume series dedicated to the history of El Museo um, and also considering the collection in relation to um, modern and contemporary art, popular traditions, graphics, Taino art, and contemporary works by Dominican artists. So various categories that again, um, as Rodrigo and I are moving forward and the rest of the curatorial team and education as we continue to move forward with our project. Um, all of these very nuanced, very um, interdisciplinary typologies continue to be a source for our own work as we continue to move forward and also bring in new contemporary um, methodologies today. So with that, I believe we have time for a very brief 
two minute break before we welcome our keynote speaker, Adriana Zavala to the stage. Thank you. Thank you all again for being with us this afternoon. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome um, Adriana Zavala, the Executive Director of the US Latinx Art Forum, an Associate Professor in Art History and Race, Colonialism and Diaspora Studies at Tufts, Universi Tufts University, and the current Andrew W. Mellon Professor at the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Um, and I'd also like to share that Adriana has very generously compiled a list of resources that we will be sharing out in the um, chat function for those of you who are interested. We'll follow with a brief Q&A, but um, first, thank you, Adriana, for being with us. Thank you so much, Susana. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So let me go ahead and share my screen if I can. Um, okay, I think that should be right. Um, okay, hi everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, can you hear me okay? Just wanna confirm. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. I'm just Thanks, Susana. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Rodrigo, Susana, and Lee for inviting me. Um, before I dive into my presentation, I first gratefully acknowledge the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral homelands we're, we're gathered wherever we are. I am in Washington, DC. I acknowledge the Piscataway and the Nacogdoches peoples on whose ancestral homelands settlers built the US Capitol. I also acknowledge the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area today. Second, I want to express my solidarity with the people across the Caribbean Basin in the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Cuba, and Florida, and especially Puerto Rico, devastated by hurricanes Fiona and Ian, not least on the five-year anniversary of Hurricane Maria. I want to recognize as well that Puerto Rico remains the oldest colony in the Americas, <clears throat> and the devastation wrought by the hurricanes compounds the ongoing effects of neocolonialism and disaster capitalism in the archipelago. We've convened today to think about the history of our art in spaces like El Museo, built by and for community, and also to consider the presence and lack thereof of Latinx art within US institutional art world contexts. The aim of this gathering being, as just explained by Susana, to create a working context for the reinstallation of El Museo's important and wide-ranging permanent collection. 
<clears throat> For my presentation, I was asked to offer a quote, short overview of the histories of collecting and exhibiting Latinx art in museums and other art institutions across the United States. A virtually impossible task, because as we will see, the history of Latinx art is deep, rich, and complex, notwithstanding our exclusion from mainstream institutions that were founded to center the history of art produced by white men. Carlos Tortolero, founder in 1982, of the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago's historically Mexican and Latino Pilsen neighborhood, expressed it this way in December 2000. He said, quote, okay, listen up museum world, let's all say it. Mainstream museums are elitist and discriminatory institutions. It isn't difficult to say, and honestly, it isn't difficult to change. We aren't trying to solve the meaning of life. Museums are not boxes with things inside. They are created by people, run by people, attended by people, and showcase artwork of people. Since no one is perfect, museums are capable of acting in a shameful and elitist way. Let's admit we have problems, he wrote, and let's re reallocate resources to move forward in an equitable way, close quote. For the title of my presentation, I've borrowed the premise of reimagining identity, and I invite us to reflect on those words and their possible meanings by playing with the italics, font, color, and punctuation that you see in my PowerPoint. What does identity reimagined mean? For many of us, these words may spur a recognition of the ways that identity, particularly as a pan-ethnic construct, that is to say a politics, more than as descent or essence, has served as a strategy for constituting inquiry and practice, such that Latina, Latino, or Latinx art is brought into existence as a discrete category with its own histories, logics, politics, outside of the exclusionary mainstream. In other words, in an art world organized to our disadvantage by the logics of white male national privilege, identity has been one strategy whereby our communities in the plural have claimed space both within and beyond the mainstream. At the same time, identity reimagined seems also to suggest a pushback against identity as the very reason we are excluded. As mainstream political and cultural rhetoric reveals, Latinxes are imagined as forever foreign, as non-citizens, as violent, and our cultures are cast as antithetical to the supposed Anglo-Saxon core of the United States. Simultaneously, however, whether as US born, as naturalized, as undocumented, as racialized within the binary system of the US, as poor or working class, as urban or as rural, so-called Latino, Latina, Latinx identity and its variants has also been the reason for our exclusion from the privileges of membership within the Latin American art and culture sphere and its various national categories. At any rate, the pre premise identity reimagined serves as a provocation pointing to identity as the basis for Latinx exclusion from the mainstream and as the basis for our periodic inclusion and as the basis for having created separate spaces to serve our own communities. In 30 minutes, I can hardly do justice to the history of Latinx art or to the generations of artists, activists, curators, scholars, and collectors who created art, uplifted their communities, and have been motivated by what Karen Mary Davalos has insightfully called a quote, poetics of love and rescue. In that spirit, I've created a document that I hope El Museo will share and Susana indicated it'll be available in the chat that acknowledges all of the scholars who have come before me and those with whom I work side by side to argue for and complicate this thing in this field we call Latinx art. Notwithstanding my use of the terms our and Latinx, I recognize that Latino, Latina, Latinx, Latine are not uncontentious terms. They risk encompassing and or invisibilizing myriad group as well as individualized ethnic, racial, gender, and political identities. At the same time, I would argue that terms like Latinx originating in a refusal of patriarchy and the gender binary can facilitate coalition building. Keenly aware of the problematics of the terminology at the US Latinx Art Forum, for example, we are claiming resources in order to open spaces and opportunities for multi-generational artists and other members of our vast community. We now have over 700 members in the forum. And I'm very proud of what we've accomplished in partnership with the New York Foundation for the Arts and with generous support from the Mellon and Ford Foundations to create the Latinx Artist Fellowship. Personally, I embrace the term Latinx. While I recognize its limitations, for me, Latinx represents not an identity, but a possibility. 
The X insists that we recognize and resist binaries that do not serve our collective best interests and that we build bridges between our communities and with BIPOC peoples and allies. These principles have been eloquently expressed by three artists whom I admire greatly. First, the Afro-Indigenous poet and artist, Alan Pelaez Lopez, who originates from Oaxaca, Mexico and is now based in the Bay Area. They have written, quote, the X in Latinx is a wound, not a trend, whereby they signal cross-cutting experiences of racial and gendered violence, the roots of which lie in the coloniality of power. Velaz Lopez reflects in their essay on how violence has been visited, particularly on indigenous, black, and genderqueer members of our communities. Second, Ecuadorian American New York City-based artist Ronnie Quevedo has offered the formulation, quote, the X is a point of entry, not of closure. And in the context of her use of the X as a graphical symbol, fiber artist Consuelo Jimenez Underwood, Huichol Chicana teacher and healer, has eloquently explained that, quote, the X is the final identifier of our still colonized status. Taking inspiration from these artists and many others, I offer the Latinx art, or however we choose to name it, must continue to struggle against its colonized status. While we fight for inclusion, our commitment must be to unmake and unsettle mainstream institutions built to center white patriarchy, and in so doing, honor and continue the community-rooted luchas the struggles of our forebears. Before I highlight some instances of Latinx representation in museums and collections in the positive, it's crucial to call out the historical ways in which Latinx art has been excluded and concealed within museums, exhibitions, collections, and the field of art history. And what follows, I invite us to question categories because they are, after all, merely, quote, operative constructs, to quote Dr. Tomas Ibarra Frausto. Latino, Latina, Latinx, Chicano, Chicana, Chicanx, Cuban American, or New Yorican are no more nor less constructs than our American, Latin American, European, or even global contemporary. These terms signal not biologically determined ethnic essences, but rather they are ideological, but also necessary categories that create coherence within complex landscapes of practice and inquiry. And of course, identity-based categories, Latinx, Black, queer, and so forth, insist on visibility in contexts where BIPOC peoples are relentlessly decentered, if not entirely excluded. As our current political landscape makes clear, this country is neither post-race nor, nor post-identity. Terms like Chicanx or Afro-Boricua or Latinx are about self-naming and representational authority and autonomy. They are demands for recognition for equity and justice. And by the way, this was as true for American art or Latin American art, which emerged in the post-war period to demand recognition in the field of art history, the origins of which were of course European, and to develop strategies to dispel entrenched notions of derivation. I illustrate such a politics of refusal, an oppositional stance in the face of racial bias and exclusion with this now famous photograph, which documents the moment when members of the collective ASCO signed their names to one such mainstream institution, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. As Ondine Chavoya has written in 1972, quote, I quote, ASCO, ASCO took the issues of minority representation, access and inclusion at, a pu at public museums to an unprecedented extreme, close quote. As recounted by Harry Gamboa Jr. one evening in 1972, he, Gronk and Willie Arron, all members of the collective ASCO, signed their names to the entrance of LACMA, and in so doing, they transformed the museum itself into the first conceptual work of Chicano art to be exhibited at LACMA. Their intervention was conceived in response to a LACMA curator's dismissive statement to Gamboa that Chicanos made graffiti or folk art, but not art, hence their absence from the gallery walls. Chan Noriega observes, quote, in other words, Chicano art was a categorical impossibility. But in signing the museum, ASCO collapsed the space between graffiti and conceptual art, at once fulfilling the biased thinking that justified their exclusion. And they refigured the entire museum as an art object itself, in accordance with the terms of institutional critique that were being developed at the time." Close quote. In other words, the young members of ASCO were incredibly sophisticated in their understanding of the structural and institutionalized operations of racism, and they were also clearly engaged with conceptual experiments in the contemporary art of their day. Noriega continues, when LACMA whitewashed ASCO signatures, it simultaneously removed graffiti and destroyed the world's largest work of Chicano art, 
close quote. Thus, this artwork survives only by this photograph, taken the next morning and featuring Patsy Valdez, also a founding member of ASCO, posing on the footbridge so as to draw attention to the signatures as both the artist imprint, but also as graffiti. Chicana, Chicano, and Chicanx art have come a long way, or has come a long way, since this photograph was taken. At LACMA, not least through the interventions and scholarship of John Noriega, Rita Gonzalez, Pilar Tompkins Rivas, Andine Javoya, and others who have concertedly intervened in and expanded the museum's collections and purviews to give a place of prominence to Chicanx and Latinx art in the galleries and permanent collection. So where else, where else and why has such intervention been necessary? So the vexing issue of Latinx art's concealment, because it's always been vital and present, even if unseen by the mainstream, necessitates that I mention, at least in passing, particular kinds of demands for recognition. So on my screen on the left is the cover of the Smithsonian Institution Willful Neglect Report from 1994, which was the result of a commission study which called out the lack of Latino Latina representation among the staff at the United States premier museological complex for history and culture. On the right, you see an updated report from 2018 um, undertaken at the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center which looks back at the willful neglect report and its 10 recommendations and gives it passing or failing grades. So first, let me quote from the willful neglect report itself. As you see on my screen, it said the following, the task force could not identify a single area of Smithsonian operations in which Latinos are appropriately represented. As the premier cultural institution in the US, the Smithsonian plays a fundamental role in determining the parameters of US cultural identity. In effect, the institution projects the idea that Latino history and culture are not a legitimate part of the American experience. And among the task force's findings were these. Latinos who in 1994 were 9% of the US population. And of course, now they're we are 19%. In 1994, they were only 2.7% of the Smithsonian's workforce and only 2.1% of museum staff at the Smithsonian Institution were Latino. The report also found that Latinos were absent from curatorial or positions of authority at the Smithsonian Museums, and that this per perpetuated the exclusion of Latino history and culture from the institution, and 10 recommendations were brought forward. As I said, the 2018 UCLA report found that in only three areas of those 10 had things been successfully achieved. This was the founding of the Smithsonian Latino Center established in 1997 and the center's establishing of the biannual conference Latino Art Now. The Latino Curatorial Initiative was established and emphasis on building programs and pipelines was evident. So what I wanna say about this and then I'll move on is that part of the um, a positive effects of the curatorial initiative is that brilliant women such as E. Carmen Ramos, Taina Caragol, and Ariana Curtis, among other Latinx curators and staff, were hired at the Smithsonian. Thus, while we know that Latinx art and culture are a vital part of this country's landscape, it's clear that we must still demand accountability, as the 2018 report shows. And this is evident in the hard-fought battle to create the National Museum of the American Latino at the Smithsonian. The particular issue of lack of recognition of Latinx artists' contributions to art history is blatantly evident as well in a study conducted by a team of mathematicians at Williams College in collaboration with curator and art historian extraordinaire, Andine Chavoya, along with Kevin Murphy at the Williams College Museum of Art and Stephen Nelson, who was then on the faculty in art history at UCLA, and of course is now the Dean at CAS of CASVA at the NGA. So this is a complicated slide and I'm gonna walk us through it quickly. But in their study, this team of researchers asked not about the level of Latinx staff in the workforce of the institutions they surveyed. And these were 18 mainstream encyclopedic art museums. But instead they asked about the gender, ethnicity and region of origin of art and artists represented in the collections of these 18 museums. And the findings are sobering if not unsurprising. And so quickly, I'll tell you that the 18 museums were the Detroit Institute of Art, the Met, MFA Boston, the NGA, Philadelphia, the Art Institute of Chicago, Nelson Atkins, RISD, Dallas, Denver, the High Museum, LACMA, MFA Houston, MOCA in LA, um, MoMA, SF MoMA, Whitney, and Yale. So what these researchers did is that they scraped the collections of these 18 museums 
yielding 10,108 total individual artist records. Out of these 10,000 records, only 230 artists could be identified as Hispanic Latino. And I note that this included artists from Spain. So as a result, 12 artists were Hispanic Latino from North America and 148 of these 230 were of Latin American or Caribbean origin. So the takeaway is that out of 10,000 artists collected across these museums, only 2.8% were Hispanic or Latinx. And again, that includes Latin America and Spain. So that is truly sobering. Okay. So here again, I wanna quote Sean Noriega. In an essay called Preservation Matters, he wrote the following. He said, the archive, and I would interject the art museum, is a political institution that excludes much more than it includes. Without a presence in the archive or the art museum, excluded groups are less able to tell their stories within the marketplace of ideas. Being skeptical about the archive and historical truth, for example, the art canon, its categories, notions of quality and universality, not to mention fixed identities, in no way contradicts the necessity of introducing new materials into the archive that can complicate the historical record. So in essence, we have to be skeptical of the archive of the museum and of truth, but we also have to insist on presence in the archive. So what does this look like? So I'm showing you the covers of two catalogs from the Museum of Modern Art. The one on the left is the collection catalog organized by Lincoln Kirstein in 1943 to showcase MoMA's collection of art from Latin America. I want to observe that there were only nine Latin American nations represented in this catalog. There were no artists from Puerto Rico or Central American countries, and there were most definitely no artists of US Latino heritage. The catalog on the right hand side is from an exhibition called Masters of Popular Painting, Modern Primitives of Europe and America. And this was an exhibition curated in 1938 by Dorothy Miller and Holger Cahill. And Cahill was at the time employed by the um, Works Pro Pro Progress Administration. The Masters of Popular Painting exhibition included 13 American artists, including Pedro Cervantes, who was born in Arizona and then lived in New Mexico. 11 of Pedro Cervantes paintings were included in this exhibition. And here you see one of the paintings called Croquet Ground, with, which I've not been able to locate. It was one of the 11 paintings. And he was also included in an exhibition called 35 Under 35. And here you see his photograph as illustrated in the Masters of Popular Painting catalog. So he's really an extraordinary artist. I don't have much time to go into it. I would encourage you to read Te Mariana Nunn's book, Sin Nombre, Hispana and Hispano Artists of the New Deal Era, where she talks about Pedro Cervantes in detail. But this is an extraordinary painting, because if you look at it, you see that it's called Croquet Ground, and it shows two men playing croquet on a field that seems to be floating in the air, supported by what looks like a steel frame structure or perhaps an oil derrick. But this is a painting that demonstrates that Pedro Cervantes was really not a popular master. He was a very sophisticated artist, and this painting suggests a dialogue with surrealism. So we can question why he was included in this exhibition at MoMA. So in the exhibition catalog, Alfred Barr, the director of MoMA, said the following. Popular art has always existed, um, since, and since the past century, it has been given increasing attention. But it's only since the apotheosis of Henry Rousseau that individual popular artists have been taken seriously. Quote, the purpose of this exhibition is to show without apology or condescension, the paintings of some of these individuals, not as folk art, but as the work of painters of marked talent and consistently distinct personality. So Pedro Cervantes was um, a very sophisticated artist, as you can see also in this painting that looks very much like an American scene painting but his use of color, the compositional structure, the geometry, the rake of light that's washing across the laundry line. Um, it's a very interesting painting. And thankfully this painting was transferred from the General Services Administration, which is the entity that held all of the works that were created by the Works Project Administration. It was transferred into the Smithsonian American Art Museum um, where it is now housed. Um, and this painting was one of um, many, many, many that were included in Carmen Ramos's exhibition, Our America, the Latino Presence in American Art. This is such an important exhibition and Carmen's role at the Smithsonian in acquiring a collection and then putting it on view in this exhibition is so important. 
But what I wanna signal here is that while um, the exhibition was called Our America, the Latino Presence in American Art, a title that very much insists on our presence within the history of American art, Carmen's essay was actually titled, What is Latino About American Art? And so I'll invite you to think about that title because what it does is it actually inverts the power dynamic. It doesn't just demand that we be included in the history of American art. It asserts that we have always been a part of American art. And instead it asks, what is Latino about American art? Okay. So in my preparation of my comments today, I was looking around at all kinds of different things and including these MoMA exhibition catalogs. And I found another artist who I have to admit I had never heard of. Um, and he's an artist named Jose de Rivera. That was his artist name. He was actually born Jose Ruiz de Rivera. Um, and he's an artist who is represented in the National Gallery of Art. And so on the left, I'm showing you an object in the National Gallery of Art, which is a geometric abstract sculpture called Black, Yellow, Red from 1942. Um, his oral history was collected in the Smithsonian Archives of American Art in 1968. And he was an artist who was also included in an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. And this was called New Horizons in American Art. So what is interesting about these exhibitions at MoMA is that they were acknowledging these artists as American artists. And of course, art history is a peculiar field. And so now we are sort of separating these things. And of course, many of us are arguing for an integrated understanding of the history of art. Um, but it's interesting to think about the ways in which these artists were being exhibited as American artists in the 30s and 40s. Um, and so I'm showing you an installation view where one of um, Jose de Rivera's uh, sculptures, a steady, was shown in the gallery. And you see it here on the far right hand side of my screen. And then you see um, a photograph of the finished sculpture um, from 1936 that was ultimately called Flight and was actually installed at the Newark Airport. Um, and indications are that it is currently part of the collection of the Newark Museum of Art. So I simply want to raise the question, American artist, Hispanic American artist, Latino artist. Um, and these are some of the questions that we could ask about um, these artists who have mostly been concealed or invisibilized within the history of American art. Okay. So I know we've heard a bit about El Museo, but I want to uh, establish some, some sort of ground in order to talk about a couple of other institutions. So first and foremost, I wanna assert um, that museums are culturally specific institutions. All museums are, whether we acknowledge this or not. And El Museo was of course founded in 1969 by Rafael Montañez Ortiz. And we should think and meditate upon the name of the museum, El Museo del Barrio, the neighborhood museum. Of course, as Susana just explained, Montañez Ortiz was the director of the first director of the museum from 1969 to 1971. And the history of the institution is so interesting. Um, so I'll just add to the things that Susana shared that um, Montañez Ortiz was commissioned by the New York City Board of Education to create not a museum, but a curriculum on Puerto Rican history, culture, folklore, and art. And instead, Montañez Ortiz conceived of a museum for his community. El Museo del Barrio opened in a classroom at PS 125. It's had multiple homes, including its now present home. And the entire conception of the museum was grounded in anti and decolonial activism and in Montañez Ortiz's understanding of his own and his community's ethnic identity and art as integrated. And for him, and he asserted in several pieces of writing that the museum was a source of dignity and a springboard for decolonization, mental and political. So I've pulled a couple of quotes that I think are really important. In an essay from 2003 um, called The Artist and the Community in the Voces and Visiones catalog, Montañez Ortiz wrote the following. He said, the founding of El Museo was a mindful process. I had to engage the community and think about what would best serve the needs of a disenfranchised underclass community. What culture and art is the community being exposed to? What are they being deprived of? The community needs a powerful cultural institution that would reveal its past, affirm and guide its present, and inspire its future with integrity and intellectual authority. The community needs a museum that explored the natural history, anthropology, culture, and art of the Puerto Rican people, and that joined it to the world of Latino, Latina art, as well as the larger world of artists. And then this is my favorite quote. It was no accident that I would see a museum as a solution. After all, it was the solution of the economically and politically empowered. 
an affirmation of their cultural identity when they founded the Museum of Modern Art, the Solomon Guggenheim, the Metropolitan, and the Whitney Museum of American Art. And I give you the dates of the founding of these museums because they're not that old. They're not that much older than El Museo. So in short, Montañez Ortiz recognized the cultural and ideological power of the encyclopedic museum, but he wedded this concept to the civil rights era demand for equity and the transformation of the structures of American democracy. As an activist and artist, he conceptualized the flexible museum model, one sensitive to public needs versus private interests. And of course, as Susana did, we have to recognize Dr. Marta Morena Vega, Moreno Vega, the second director of El Museo del Barrio, who you see here again in a photograph by Hiram Maristani. It was during her tenure as director that two really important exhibitions were put on at the, at the, at the museum. The Art Heritage of Puerto Rico, Pre-Columbian to Present, La Herencia Artística de Puerto Rico, and Aspectos de la Esclavitud en Puerto Rico, Aspects of Slavery in Puerto Rico from 1974. In her essay in the Art Heritage of Puerto Rico catalog, Moreno Vega wrote the following. In organizing this exhibition, we adhere to the concept that the more our children and communities learn about their past and present, the more effective the solutions for our future will be. So this leads me to share briefly um, some information about two other really important museums um, that I want to ensure that people are aware of. One is the Mexican Museum in San Francisco, founded in 1971 by Peter Rodriguez, shuttered in 2006, closed in 2018, and it's an open question whether this museum, such an important institution in the San Francisco area, will be reopening. This was an institution, like all museums, dedicated to exhibition, interpretation, collection, preservation, and education. And there I'm quoting Karen Mary Davalos again. So in a 2014 interview, Peter Rodriguez said the following, I used to go to museum exhibits at the Museum of Modern Art, and I noticed that there weren't any Hispanic surnames. So I said, well, the only way we're going to turn that around is to start our own museum, close quote. And a 1975 flyer or press release from the museum states the following, the Mexican Museum is a recently formed organization to promote the rich heritage and culture of Mexico and the Mexican Americans. Founder Rodriguez is a native Californian who has been collecting towards this aim for many years. So again, emphasis on collection and Susana spoke about this. And the goal was to obtain a permanent center to display and preserve this culture and continue to enlarge the collection to serve as an educational center for reaching out to the community and disseminating knowledge. And then another such institution is the, Mexic the National Museum of Mexican Art um, founded in 1982 by Carlos Tortolero, who I quoted earlier, in Chicago's predominantly Mexican-American and Latino Pilsen community. Um, and I'm showing you on the right-hand side, uh, an early catalog from the National Museum of Mexican Art, then called the Mexican Fine Art Center Museum. And this was an exhibition called Latina Art Showcase from 1987, that was curated by Juana Guzman and included 68 works of art by 22 Latinas, and these were women, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Costa Rican, Colombian, Brazilian, Argentine, and Chilean from all of these US cities. It's a really interesting exhibition. So in its mission, the museum um, was stated in this way. The museum has evolved out of a commitment to awaken the city of Chicago to the wealth and breadth of the Mexican culture. The museum is the first Mexican cultural center or museum in the Midwest and has the following goals to sponsor special events and exhibits that exemplify the rich variety found in Mexican culture, to develop a significant permanent collection of Mexican art, to encourage the professional development of local Mexican American artists, to offer educational programs, and to serve as a cultural focus for the more than half a million Mexicans residing in the Chicago area, and as a cultural ally to other Latino groups in the city of Chicago. So this is an ancient history. This is fairly recent history. And I really want to encourage us to honor these histories and to be aware of them. It's, it's so important that we know the history of our museums, of our cultural spaces, and our, our history. But I also want to underscore, of course, that Latinx art has always existed in unexpected quote unquote places. Um, and so here I want to quote from Olga Uloa Herrera um, in a conversation she had with Jennifer Gonzalez in an essay called In the Field Latino Art Archives. And there, Olga said the following. She said, 
Latina, Latino, Latinx artists aren't operating in a vacuum, but within the same structures as other American artists. And so to illustrate this, I'm showing you on the right-hand side, Rafael Montañez Ortiz's Destruction in Art, or participation at the Destruction in Art Symposium in London in 1966, well before he founded El Museo. I'm showing you Judy Baca's performance called The Vanity Table, um, in which she transformed herself from a young Chicana of the 1970s into a Pachuca of the 1950s. And you see this in the center of the screen. Um, and she did this performance, The Vanity Table, in front of a mural created by um, a group of graffiti artists called the Tiny Locas. And this was all undertaken in the Women's Building in Los Angeles, which was um, an organization, a, an art space created to showcase the work of predominantly white feminist artists in LA. Um, but here we have Judy Baca performing in this space very much avowedly as a Chicana. And then I'm showing you Patsy Valdez and Gronk's invitation to a, quote, fabulous Halloween party at LACE. And this was the Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions. And this was a, a space that was co-founded by members of ASCO with a cross-cutting array of American contemporary artists. And so just to underscore the point that we have always existed um, in the same structures as other artists, whether American artists or contemporary artists. And this is a part of the history that uh, many scholars are bringing forward. So notwithstanding the utterly bleak statistics on Latinx art and artists in the collections of the 18 mainstream encyclopedic museums as studied by Andine Chavoya and Steve Nelson, um, this um, array that you see here on the screen demonstrates that we do have an art history. And so what I'm showing you here is an array of groundbreaking exhibitions um, as represented by their catalogs. Um, we have an art history and we have to continue to dialogue and fight so that mainstream stakeholders get over their anxiety that our demands for equity equate with the unjustified erosion of the supremacy and centering of white male dominant discourses of art. Um, these are extraordinary exhibitions and no single exhibition shown here was reductively about some elusive Latinx essence. Um, instead, they range from a focus on the politics of identity within the inequitable social context of the United States. They focus on grassroots activism, institutional critique, conceptual sophistication. And here I'm referring to exhibitions like um, Cara, Chicano Art Resistance and Affirmation, LA Chicano, Presente, The Young Lords in New York, The Decade Show or Revelations, Hispanic Art of Evanescence. Other exhibitions have centered on transnational flows of people and aesthetic innovation or creative strategies in response to political exclusion. So here we could look to the exhibition Bridge Between Islands from 1978 at El Museo that included um, both stateside and island-based Puerto Rican artists. Or we could look to the Latin American Spirit, an exhibition at the Bronx Museum. There was a show about Latin American expats, but also the vibrant contributions of US Latinx artists to the US art world exhibitions about queer networks and the vibrant contributions of young Chicano, Chicana, and Chicanx artists to LA's avant-garde underground scene. Exhibitions like Home So Different So Appealing at LACMA focused on the premise of home as a concept for interrogating political instability, economic precarity, diaspora and dislocation, and relationships with others. And while without a full catalog, the Whitney's Pacha Yakta Wasichai brought together a transnational group of contemporary artists working in the US, Puerto Rico and Mexico to explore indigenous conceptions of space and place. Very recently, the Smithsonian's Printing the Revolution offered a deep survey of graphics within the Chicano movement that demonstrates the enduring relationship to social justice, but also aesthetic innovation. El Museo's Triennial from 2021, which brought together over uh, brought together 100 artists from across the United States working in a variety of media, very conceptually challenging work, deeply committed to justice. And our art history is also evident in monographs and anthologies. And so here I'm showing you at the top an array of the books published by the Chicano Studies Research Center and the University of Minnesota under the imprint of Aver, Revisioning Art History, and then a whole array of extraordinary books um, by scholars to whom my work is indebted. I'm gonna move quickly through my last slides. There are so many extraordinary research resources from rhizomes, Mexican-American art since 1848, 
co-led by Karen Mary Davalos and Constance Cortez, which is a multi-component ecosystem that will resolve misunderstandings and invisibility of visual art by Mexican American artists, a dispossessed community. And it includes a post-custodial portal linking to digital information and libraries, archives, and museums. They also have an interactive map that I'm showing you at the top. We now have a flagship journal published by University of California Press. Um, the International Center for the Arts of the Americas um, is an extraordinary resource, resource. You see their publication here and through their website, scholars can find untold numbers of primary sources. Scholars in the Midwest are doing work to make sure that we understand the history of Latinx artists in the Midwest. And so here's a link to latinoartmidwest.com. The Archives of American Art is an extraordinary resource with over 100 oral histories and artist papers, ranging from Tomas Ibarra Frausto's papers to artist papers. So here I'm showing you work Alvarez and Gerald Lozano's scrapbook from 2008. Um, and then there's a really interesting archival collections guide put together by, Ta by Taina Caragol when she was um, uh, the project coordinator. And you can download this archival collections guide from the MoMA's website, and I've provided that link. Significant Museum Collections of Latinx Art and Museo, National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago, the Smithsonian, the Cheech Marin Collection, which of course just opened at the Riverside Museum of Art. And then you can search for artists at the MFA Houston, LACMA, Whitney, Davis Museum, Betis Art Museum, and MoMA. But those museums still pose challenges because you have to find the artist within their art artist databases. And that's an issue that, that we still have to, to deal with. Um, research centers, UCLA, Hunter College, the Centro de Estudios Puerto Ricanos, CUNY Dominican Studies, Cuban Studies Institute, the IUPLR, Latinx Project at NYU, at Notre Dame. So many extraordinary resources um, that we can use in order to tell our own stories. And then last but not least, the founding and development of community-specific museums, exhibition spaces, and collections. And I'm just showing you a tiny fraction of the hundreds of art spaces and so I encourage everyone listening to learn more about these institutions and to participate in what Karen Mary has called a poetics and love and rescue. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adriana. And I just would like to open, um, the Q&A is open to all of you in attendance to so please um, feel free to ask, uh, I hope you don't mind to ask our panelists, Adriana. Um, and I, I just would like to start with a comment um, before we move to some questions and just to acknowledge um, the important role of citing sources as you just did. You know, I think um, so many people now view this Latinx concept, idea, term, however we wanna think about it as something that's brand new. And I always think how important it is to assert that legacy to acknowledge not only the scholars who came for us, but also um, the many generations of artists who have paved the way for new generations. And uh, even inciting the citing, I just wanna acknowledge, um, I think it's uh, Rocio and Deborah Cullen who always um, were emphasizing that in their own talks. Um, and since they are, uh, some of my own uh, people that I look to when I am citing things wanted to just really reiterate that um, that emphasis. I'm going to check if we have any Q&A's. Uh, hi, Adriana, thank you so much. This was really, really wonderful. It's a really fantastic uh, response to our uh, provocation to you so we're like humbled and honored to you know i be uh, having you today as a uh, you know with with this lecture i i have a question uh i don't know if i'll like formulate it very um in like in a very perfect way but i want to you know just put the finger there a little bit it's about like several examples i think that it's just like the the larger framework for that is like comparative studies or comparative mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know approaches between Latinx and Latin American art fields no mm -hmm. I mean I think you brought up uh, several examples where we saw that uh, happening 
there was like a show that about the the, the female artist that was like very interested mm-hmm. about because I didn't know about that show, mm-hmm. but and mm-hmm. that I had impression. I think it's more like Latino, Latina, or Latina in that case. But also, you know, more recent exhibitions, Home that you you know brought up, created by John Noriega and Mari Carmen Ramirez, and several others. So. With that in mind, and also, you know, the, like the pre-civil rights era um, um, and the post-civil rights era, two like moments also, I would like to ask you a, a, if you can go a little uh, more like close up on the, you know, comparative studies or the, the needs of, you know, more dialogue between these two fields, because I really see sometimes in terms of, um, Latinx art. This is something, a wonderful discussion I had with Carolina Caicedo once. It's American art. We all agree it's American art, mm-hmm. but it's also a point of intersection of arts in, mm-hmm. from other parts of the world. No? And I think that's very mm-hmm. enriching. It's, it's non-European. It's, mm-hmm. it's anti-colonial as I, you know, as I see it. So I just wanted, if you could like elaborate on that a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think at the very least, I see it as you know, one ring within a Venn diagram. And, you know, Venn diagrams often just have three rings, but, you know, I want to see it as sort of multiple, you know, activist communities in conversation with one another. So, you know, I think that they're, you know, the exhibitions that that really sort of show us a path forward are the exhibitions that de- with, deeply within their conceptual foundations understand that Latinx art doesn't operate in a vacuum. It never has. It never, never has, right? And so, you know, I use the term Latinx because I I want to insist on presence and on recognition in a context where, you know, Chavoya Nelson et al., um, you know, their study of of 18 encyclopedic museums shows us that this is still a fight we're having. We have to be activist scholars, right? Because the mainstream is entirely unsettled by our insistence in unsettling categories. So I don't use Latinx or US Latinx because I think it only exists in the United States. That's ridiculous. Um, But I also don't want to see it only coupled with Latin American because so much of what, what conditions the Latinx experience, whether you arrived yesterday, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, or we're we're five generations born here, is US empire and empire writ large, right? And that's not to say that artists in Latin America haven't experienced empire, of course they have. Um, So, you know, ultimately this is, you know, a tortuous conversation, you know, should Latinx be coupled with Latin American? Should Latinx be thought of as American art? It's all of these things and both of these things. And, you know, we have to take stock of the anti-Blackness within Latinidad, within Latinx communities, within the Latin American community. But, you know, I think what does distinguish Latinx is its activists, grassroots origins, and we have to acknowledge that the field of Latin American art history, I'm not talking about praxis in Latin America by Latin American artists. I'm talking about the field of art history of Latin American art has very deep roots in Cold War era politics in the United States and institutions like MoMA, and it has very deep roots in national privilege. And, you know, my friend Arlene Davila has explained that to us, right? Latinx artists can't claim American national privilege you know, because everything in this country tells us we're not American, nor can they claim the national privilege of operating within the markets and museological structures of Brazil or Argentina or Chile or Venezuela or, or Mexico for that matter. So we just need to understand that this is a complicated landscape and it's a neither nor landscape and it's a both and landscape at the same time. But, you know, I don't know how else to answer that question. Well, this is great. This is great. I think this, I mean, this, the multiplicity, of course, I think it's a great you know, uh, point to understand it. But I'm, I was even more interested in what you say about like regional problems or regional issues and how they reflect our understanding of Latin American art, which is, I think, you know, sometimes very uh, reductive and, and limited. So mm-hmm. I think yeah. this is part of, this is part of the conversation, you know, to really uh, understand the contribution of uh, like the African diaspora in the art of Brazil. It's really or in the Caribbean, of course. It's really part right. of how we make this, uh, in my understanding, 
a more uh, equitable and a more uh, a, a more interesting field, frankly, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, so I thank you for your uh, reflections on that, Adriana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, yeah I and I would just say to the oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Susanna. No, no, please, Adriana. No, I would just encourage people to go back to that essay I quoted from Carlos Tortolero. It was actually published in 2000 in Art News, where he calls out museums as discriminatory institutions, right? I mean, art history and museums were founded to center white male artists. Let's just admit it. And then he says, it's not about needing more resources. It's about reallocating resources. And so I, I used that word specifically, reallocating resources. If a museum wants to change the contours of its collection, it's about reallocating resources and saying that acquisitions budgets that are devoted to perpetuating this vision that art comes from certain privileged populations. No, you have to move money. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say that um, you, in, in answering Rodrigo's comment, you noted the activist roots. So I just wanna acknowledge that Moncho Lopez also um, was making that comment in the Q and A and of course, you know, we've all been saying Hiram Marisani's name, but so many of the funders of El Museo were Young Lords members. Um, and I think, you know, that is the case for so many of the other institutions um, that you also brought up in their equivalent communities. But uh, maybe on the note of real allocating resources, um, I think Alicia Mernick's question seems apropos. Uh, what is your perspective on the potential conflicts between the fight for inclusion within encyclopedic museums and the creation of own spaces for communities to create museums for us, by us, near us, which I think is an, I'm always interested in that idea of like proximities. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Thank you, Alicia, for that question. Um, I mean, I, I could have just talked, for example, about that MoMA exhibition, you know, Masters of Modern Painting, and just talked only about that, because I think, um, you know, that's a really interesting example. On the one hand, Pedro Cervantes in 1938 being included in a MoMA exhibition, but we have to look at the terms of inclusion, right? This was an exhibition that started with the European popular painters. They were the first ones in the catalog. One of the press releases I found online actually only lists them. And Henri Rousseau's name gets, you know, brought up, you know, we have our own Henri Rousseau's, right? So the terms of inclusion, I'm very suspicious of them. So on the one hand, we have to demand inclusion, but again, following on Carlos Tortolero, we have to unsettle the institutions that we want to be included in, right? We have to say these are discriminatory institutions. And the reason we need to be included there is because they are what constitute cultural identity in this country. But at the same time, we absolutely have to be true to the activist roots that form the field, right? So we have to support institutions that continue to honor those activist roots. So again, I don't have a simple and straightforward answer, but I don't want inclusion if it's on the terms of the institutions as unsettled. I would only want to be included so that I could unsettle the structure and have an honest conversation about the discriminatory and racist aspects of that structure. Um, I mean, I'm an academic and I can say these pie in the sky things, how you implement this is another thing, but we have to name it, right? So that's what I, my response would be. We need, still need community spaces. We still need spaces to center our culture, but we also have to unsettle the mainstream. And for me, unsettling is a very powerful concept. And I, I wonder if something um, that you mentioned earlier is also uh, related to this question, which is the idea of coalition building. Um, you know, here we are in New York at El Museo, but of course we look to well, what we what we call our peers, but they're very different um, from us in scale and size and resources um, mm -hmm. at the Whitney um, and, and, and uh, at other local institutions. But I, I think that coalition building, it goes hand in hand with the acknowledgement of all of the existing sources that are already are there for us to I mean, it's not even there for us to find, they're, they're there. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what I wanted to demonstrate. That's why I actually sent you all that PDF and it's not a complete PDF. I mean, there's so many things that I may have overlooked or forgotten, but it's about a citational politics, right? I am most definitely not doing this work alone and neither are you or Rodrigo. Um, there are legions of people that have come before us and whom we stand with shoulder to shoulder and citational politics is really important. There is an art history here. 
there is a praxis. And first of all, it's the artists, right? What can we do to support the artists? And multi-generationally, right? This is why in the Latinx Artist Fellowship, we're awarding annually five emerging artists, five mid-career and five established artists with each cohort, right? Everybody has to pull forward together. I know we want to leave um, just a bit of a moment for a breather before the next panel. Um, so I, I know we do have more, more questions uh, lined up in the Q&A. Um, if there's something we wanna tackle briefly, uh, obviously all of these terms and concepts are so large, you know, this we can't possibly cover it in the time we have remaining. Um, but perhaps, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure if it serves us to go into uh, individual particularities, but maybe maybe Mancho's question um, provides an interesting kind of closing point um, about how, Mancho, I'll, I'll just quote you, Mancho, um, how back in the day in their youth, museums tended to be ravenous and their collecting seems to be less discerning, less complicated, less worried with considerations of space than what we see today, which is a process full of obstacles, hoops, and real estate considerations, at least the case mm -hmm. with history museums. Of course, that puts us in the situation that whiteness was allowed to flow in at times indiscriminately, but when we mm -hmm. try to get other voices in, we face all these barriers. Is there a way out of that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, I mean, that's not a question I can answer in two minutes. It's a really good question. I mean, I think that part of it is really tackling, you know, coming in with the understanding that the canon is a construct and that its origins are in the era of genocide and colonialism, right? Um, and that its origins are super selective. And so anytime somebody invokes notions of quality, I just respond that quality is subjective. Right, so bring in a panel, a cross-cutting panel of experts into your curatorial decisions to decide who's going, I mean, I'm not saying anybody, <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, we, this is, this is how we unsettle institutions. We just simply do not accept, accept business as usual. And, you know, this question of, well, a particular museum says they can't designate, you know, a, an acquisitions line for Latinx art or BIPOC artists, it's like, well, why not, you know, pull money from here and take it over there. And I know that that makes people feel unsettled and um, threatened. But if we really want a cultural sphere that is more equitable, hard things have to happen. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's the only way I can answer that question is that we just, we, we can't take no for an answer and we can't accept responses that are about the status quo. I, and we I have to honor I wanna, our I want to quote you on something you said before, that every institution is culture specific. So, I mean, yeah. are we changing other yeah. cultures? I'm not sure. So yeah. good luck with yeah. that. Uh, sure. But I, I think it's worth trying, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, why, that's why we're doing what we're doing, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So. Well, I think... Um, you know, these hard questions will, will not be answered today, but that is why we're, we're doing what we're doing. Um, and I think since we just have four minutes um, before our next panel, um, I want to, again, we want to thank you, Adriana, for, for being our focus speaker, our keynote speaker. And we'll take a brief break and see you all back in um, four minutes for our next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, email. I have an open.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, apologies for the delay, but thank you so much to Adriana um, and Rodrigo and Susana so far. That was a really wonderful presentation from Adriana. Um, and I know we were all very moved by it. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce our panel. We um, have had some last minute emergencies, so we may have to rearrange this order somewhat. So this uh, panel, however, is uh, gonna be really wide ranging. We're gonna cover East Harlem art networks, uh, such as Enfoco and Taya Boricua, the importance of print culture and photography in New York and activism, and Puerto Rican vanguards and their afterlives. Um, I'm going to begin by introducing Serda Yalkin, who's a PhD candidate in the Department of Art, Art History, and Visual Studies at Duke University. And then we're going to hand it over to Melissa Ramos Borges, who's a professor in art history and theory at the University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez, and Rio Petras. We're still hoping that Abigail Lapendardashti can join us. Um, and either way, I am asking everyone to put any Q&A in the Q&A function, and we'll have a Q&A for all participants at the end of the talks. But now I'm going to hand it over to Serda, and thank you again for joining us, everyone. Hi there, just going to share my screen. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so before I begin, I just wanted to thank Susana, Rodrigo, and Lee for their invitation to speak today, and to Adriana and the other panelists for sharing their um, inspiring and important ideas and research. And of course, to everyone watching the program, uh, it's an honor to be part of this conversation. On a summer day in 1974, the Artist Collective and FOCO staged the first photographic exhibition at the annual Puerto Rican Folkloric Festival in New York City's Central Park. A photograph from the occasion reveals a display of prints on the exterior of a freestanding four wall enclosure erected on a lawn. Amid the crowd of spectators, a child in a wide brim hat pauses in contemplation, eye level with the photographs, a stance echoed by another child in profile. The image testifies to the relationship between photography and community, in this case framing its youngest members as central protagonists. The Folkloric Festival was established in 1967 to celebrate the heritage and culture of the Puerto Rican diaspora in New York. A program for artistic expression was added in 1974 by the newly founded Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College to showcase, quote, art born from the Puerto Rican reality in the U.S., arising from the streets, expressing the attitudes, feelings, and history of the Puerto Rican masses, end quote. And FOCO's participation thus marked the premiere of photography in the event, asserting the medium's proficiency in reflecting the spirit of the New York experience. The belief in the medium's significance for Puerto Rican photographers and the community at large is what drove Charles Biasini Rivera, Phil Dante, and Roger Caban to establish and FOCO earlier that year. And here we have an image of the founding members, uh, including uh, George Malave and Nesta Cortijo as well. In response to the lack of representation of Puerto Rican photographers in galleries and museums, as well as professional opportunities and resources, the founding members envisioned a collaborative space to exhibit work, to create group portfolios, and develop educational and mentorship programs. In these early years, Enfoco put substantial effort into fostering the public's relationship with photography. They organized street galleries that showcased photographs on neighborhood blocks and in parks like the event in Central Park, where members also set up Polaroid studios to teach instant photography. The group created programs that catered to a range of skill levels, offering free or affordable technical workshops and seminars on subjects from camera basics to preparing photographic portfolios. After becoming incorporated in 1978, and FOCO established headquarters in a Bronx building donated by Lehman College, and the following year launched a visual literacy workshop to teach photography to public school students in the South Bronx. In 1985, and FOCO began publishing Nueva Luz, a quarterly photographic journal that highlights emerging and mid-career Latinx and other U.S.-based artists of color. Since the group's inception, the work of Enfoco photographers and the public engagement they fostered 
reflected the community-oriented photographic praxis. In addition to portfolios and exhibitions, their programs and workshops modeled a collaborative practice focused on expanded ideas of audience, viewership, pedagogy, and mentorship. In considering these efforts with specific attention to the street gallery program, I argue that Enfoco saw beyond the call for representation at the levels of both image and institution, embracing the potential of photography as a community service. To do so, I understand photography as an event or site of action, rather than a technology controlled by a singular subject to produce an image. Aligned with the scholarship of Ariella Azoulé, Krista Thompson, and Colin Gunkel, among others, this expanded framework views photography as an inherently collaborative process that encompasses the social relations, interactions, and performative acts that surround the making of images, their circulation and exhibition. A productive versus illustrative view of the medium also lends itself to studies that excavate photography's role in negotiating the terrain through which communities are imagined and articulated in the ongoing process of diaspora. Understanding representation as only a first step toward social impact, I believe in Foco's photographic practice facilitated an environment that invited the community to engage in photographic acts that actively incorporated them into the project of New Yorican visuality. Enfoco emerged during a period of Puerto Rican political and cultural awakening in New York, known as El Nuevo Despertar. In the late 1960s and 1970s, the term New Yorican became embraced politically and culturally, co-opting its derogatory use to describe New York-born or based Puerto Ricans who lacked fluency in Spanish or first-hand familiarity with the island. The New Yorican movement of artists and writers that emerged foregrounded recognition, education, and professionalization in the arts as vital to achieving empowerment and visibility in the public sphere. During this time, a myriad of formal and informal New Yorican cultural organizations, including museums, artist collectives, workshops, agencies, and exhibition spaces were established. Among these were El, Muse among these were El Museo del Barrio in 1969, the printmaking collective El Taller Boricua in 1970, the Institute of Contemporary Hispanic Art in 73, and the Caribbean Cultural Center in 75, to name just a few. These Puerto Rican artists and cultural workers promoted the democratization of art and challenged the lack of representation of artists of color in mainstream art institutions. This contribution is overlooked in histories of arts activism in the period that account for the activities of groups like the Art Workers Coalition that had a vital Puerto Rican presence. Beyond the fight for inclusion and in the spirit of self-determination, Enfoco and the organizations they developed alongside met community needs by providing educational services and artistic training that opposed elite market-driven practices. The members of Enfoco were not the first to commit photography to the task of visualizing the New York Puerto Rican experience. In the 1960s, Frank Espada, Hiram Maristini, and Maximo Rafael Colon began to photograph daily life in the barrios of East New York, East Harlem, and the Lower East Side, as well as the political atmosphere defined by grassroots activism and the struggle for civil rights. In the 1970s and 1980s, however, the community of Latinx photographers expanded considerably. Elizabeth Ferrer partly attributes this growth to the medium's general flourishing at the time due to its rising status as a quote-unquote serious art form and increased presence in museum collections and course offerings in university curricula. Photography exhibitions dedicated to the Puerto Rican experience proliferated throughout the decade, beginning in 1973 with Dos Mundos, Worlds of the Puerto Rican, organized by the Institute of Contemporary Hispanic Art. Biasini Rivera, Dante, and Caban were among the 12 photographers featured in the show, the success of which prompted them to establish and foco shortly thereafter. El Museo del Barrio played a large role in supporting New Rican photography throughout the two decades. The museum presented exhibitions including La, Gal La Galleria II Photography in 1975 and Foco's Documentation Portfolio No. 1 in 78 and La Familia in 1979. Moreover, shows such as Nine Mujeres from 1979, which featured the work of Latina photographers, and Autodretratos from 1981 were staged at F-Stop the museum's dedicated photography gallery that opened in 1978 and held 18 photographic exhibitions between its inauguration in 1982. As a result, the New Yorkian artists that found a photographic voice during the period and the institutions that supported them produced and circulated images 
that countered the racialized depictions of Puerto Rican life invented and perpetuated by the mainstream media and Hollywood, which associated the community with poverty, gangs, and criminality. And Foco's formation contributed to a decisive moment in the development of New Yorkian photography when the stakes of both picking up the camera and being photographed changed. And Foco's community-centered vision was cemented in their first collaborative print portfolio, the New York Puerto Rican Experience. The photographs taken between 1973 and 1974 were exhibited for the first time at El Museo del Barrio in 1978, following the portfolio's donation to the institution two years prior. For the project, Caban, Viacini, Rivera, and Dante utilized the themes of small business, education, and labor, and the resulting suite of 79 silver gelatin prints unveil and immortalize the texture of everyday life. The scenes encompass the urban and the rural, from city grocery fronts, barbershops, and high school cafeterias, to the living quarters of agricultural workers upstate. Students, bodega owners, sign painters, garment workers, and magazine editors emerge as the protagonists of this photographic story, many for the first time, especially with Puerto Rican photographers behind the lens. In the exhibition brochure, the group declared, quote, and FOCO believes it is not enough to create high-level art because the involvement and experience that a community may derive is as important as the aesthetic consideration, end quote. The founders of Enfoco deemed the individual status of the artist and the aesthetic concerns motivating photographic expression as secondary to the benefits and impact the medium could have on a community level. Enfoco's practical implementation of this belief utilized, that utilized photography as a wide reaching social practice is revealed in the street gallery program. Sometimes referred to as the floating community gallery, this portable unit brought photography directly to the people. Constructed from plywood doors, jury rigged with two by fours, the display was driven from site to site in an old VW microbus, easily assembled and disassembled. The exhibitions were frequently accompanied by an information table where interested passersby could converse with Enfoco members and learn about the activities and workshops they sponsored. The street gallery transformed the terms of spectatorship typically experienced in museums and galleries removed from the mausoleum or the white cube and placed into the everyday setting of the barrio, the photographs ceased to be privileged objects with value determined by aesthetic and market conditions. Displaying artwork on the streets for public consumption, however, was not unique to Enfoco. Other New Yorkian arts organizations, including the printmaking collective El Taller Boricua, also organized outdoor exhibitions and workshops. Moreover, the original idea behind El Museo del Barrio, proposed by its co-founder and early director, Rafael Montañez Ortiz, was a portable museum that could provide a practical alternative to the orthodox institution. Discussed in an article published in Art in America in 1971, Ortiz called for a museumless museum to promote accessibility using slides, tapes, film, and television to produce a multi-sensory experience. While this vision did not come to fruition as a permanent state for El Museo, the institution did launch a mobile unit in 1972 that consisted of a van that transported exhibitions, of objects, slide presentations, and film screenings to elementary schools, colleges, and community festivals throughout the city and tri-state area. In Enfoco Street Gallery, accessibility was underscored by the fact that many of the photographs were taken in the same neighborhoods in which they were exhibited. Reflecting on the impact this had on the viewing experience, Yesenia Rivera noted that the community was especially drawn to, photograph, to the photographs because for the first time, people were face to face with images that reflected their own lives and experiences, quote, as if they were seeing their own relatives, end quote. Within the alternative context of the street display, the photographs functioned as shared cultural artifacts that derive value from the community and diverse moments of individual and collective encounter. And Foco's understanding of photography's potential for building community networks is revealed in images of the street gallery that capture spectator interaction and unveil layered photographic encounters. In an unattributed photograph from 1978, a group of grinning youth pose in front of the plywood exhibit, flanked by two large scale prints. Some of the children kneel while others stand with their hands on their hips or arms resting at their sides. In this playful instant, a young boy in the middle of the cluster holds up a puppy, while another flashes two peace signs, and a girl in the back row has seemingly just dropped her hula hoop to pose. Most of their gazes, however, are drawn toward the bottom left corner of the composition, 
at someone taking their picture outside of the frame. Here, photographic acts become the subject of the image, both the act of taking a photo and the performance of posing for one. The former is reinforced by the fact that the children do not stare back at the viewer slash photographer of our frame. Instead, they pose for another, which turns the scene into a more objective interest in the act of photographing itself. As both spectators of the exhibition and photographic subjects, the children enjoy the experience of both viewing and being seen. Moreover, the transformation of the group into photographic subjects occurs against the backdrop of the works on display. They pose next to a large scale print on poster board, a close up portrait of 73 year old Doña Elvira Rodriguez taken in Puerto Rico by New York photographer Frank Mendez in 1974. Their physical and photographic union with Mendez's image on the streets of New York bonds the children to generations past and present on the island evoking the condition of diaspora as both multi-sided and visual. This functions as a photographically framed embodiment of the trans locality of the Puerto Rican diaspora, a deterritorialized identity formed outside of sovereignty and the idea of the nation state and the imagined community it continually makes and remakes. Another similar moment of community engagement with the street gallery is unveiled in a photograph by David Gonzalez, a Bronx native who joined in FOCO in 1979 after graduating from Yale and served as an educator and project coordinator. Gonzalez's image shows a street gallery set up in Roberto Clemente State Park that featured the work of photographers Phil Dante and Frank Mendez. The exhibition was part of the programming for Enfoco's first annual photographic festival, which celebrated the organization's one-year anniversary in the Bronx and consisted of four weeks of exhibitions, workshops, seminars, and film screenings that were free and open to the public. In the photograph, two spectators pose with an oversized portrait of three women affixed to a metal fence. In the large photograph used as a backdrop, the central figure rests her hand on her hip with her elbow pointed outward, a gesture echoed by the women who stand in front of it. The pair pose for a woman in the foreground, perhaps a friend, who assumes a photographer's stance with one foot in front of the other, holding a small point and shoot camera up to her eye. A small crowd of swimmers, some with towels wrapped around their waists, takes a break from the pool in the park complex, peering onto the scene through the negative space of the fence. Gonzalez's frame captures multiple photographic encounters that reveal the desirability of being on both sides of the camera. The inclusion of the woman taking the portrait, coupled with Gonzalez's gesture of documenting the scene himself, places the act of photographing into focus. This fact is reinforced by the presence of the crowd that watches the spectacle unfold, who become subjects within both photographers' frame. In reflecting on the street gallery program, Gonzalez noted the popularity of spectators posing with photographs. This is suggested in the image by another slightly camouflaged large-scale print propped against the fence that signals the availability of a second backdrop. Like in the image of the children in front of the street gallery, Gonzalez foregrounds the performative act of being photographed, what Krista Thompson has described in another context as photographic becoming in front of a community audience. In her study of black diasporic photographic and videographic practices in the Circum Caribbean, Thompson explores how visual technologies negotiate the ways diasporas are imagined and claim the right to be seen. She argues that in addition to being a tool that produces a physical representation, the camera functions as a prop in performances of visibility. Through examples of mobile street photography studios, Thompson explores how the process of being seen and being photographed becomes its own, quote, ephemeral form of image making, end quote. Publicly posing with the display of images in Enfoco Street Gallery, spectators similarly experience the photographic through a temporal performances of visibility that hold significance beyond the resulting physical image. The, gal the street gallery inspired viewers to enact the role of photographer and subject, actively incorporating them into the project of New and visuality. Ultimately, through the street exhibitions and workshops, Enfoco introduced new ways of seeing and being seen that bolstered community frame narratives and subjectivities. The group's efforts thus brought the medium's capacity to serve rather than merely represent the community into focus. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Sarada. That was a really wonderful presentation and the archival photos you found are especially beautiful. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Abigail Lapandar-Dashti, Assistant Professor of Art History and Visual Studies at the University of California, Irvine to present next. And I thank everyone for being patient with the changes to the schedule, but uh, Professor Dardashti is doing truly heroic work for art history right now. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, I hope everybody could hear me well. We can hear you, yeah, sound great. Okay, great. Um, I first wanted to thank Lee and El Museo in general so much for the invitation, for putting together the symposium, for applying for funding for it. Uh, I wanna especially thank Rodrigo and Susie for uh, all of their work in the past, since they got to El Museo actually, not just for the collection and for exhibitions, but also for uh, researchers like myself who um, have really relied on them to for access to archives and contacts within El Bajo. So I just wanted to thank them especially. Um, I wanna also thank Marcos Dimas and Elisa Larkin Nascimento for access to archives. And I'd like to dedicate uh, this talk to Hiram Maristani, who, as many of you know, um, was a great community member, photographer, activist, um, and who, thanks to Miguel Luciano, I had the pleasure of meeting and working with before he passed. Uh, today, I'm going to present an excerpt of an essay that is going to be published in American Art Journal next month. Uh, I've been talking about this essay for a very long time, so Rodrigo is probably wondering <laughs> whether it actually exists or not, but um, hopefully uh, it comes out uh, finally next month after several years. Uh, and I'm going to share some brief ideas about another essay that I'm working on now. In 1981, the New York artist Jose Soto Sanchez argued for the existence of a Caribbean aesthetic from the United States in an article published by the New York-based interdisciplinary journal Caribe, recognizing the impact of migration, colonialism, and urban inequalities on the production of art. Soto named several artists of Latin American ancestry who, in his opinion, contributed to this aesthetic. He included Abdias do Nascimento, an Afro-Brazilian painter and activist residing in the United States from 1968 to the early 1980s, who was an active participant in New York's Caribbean American and African American art scenes. A year earlier in 1980, Caribe had dedicated an entire issue to Afro-Brazilian to Afro resistance and featured an article by Nascimento discussing anti-racist activism and its expressions in visual art. Nascimento exhibited his paintings of Afro-Brazilian deities mixed with US Black power symbolism that same year at Taller Boricua, a New York and activist arts organization whose members included Soto, solidifying his place in the city's artist activist community. Informed by political debates, exhibitions, and protests in New York City, Soto, Nascimento, and New York and artist Marcos Dimas created art in the context of a burgeoning Afro-Latinx aesthetic of resistance from the late 1960s to the early 1980s. Rather than influencing one another or making derivative imagery, the artist created conversations and works that present a collective response to the needs of an Afro-Latinx community, establishing activist solidarity based on social affinity. The three artists, I argue, depicted African diasporic religious symbolism from Latin America to protest racism, producing a new visual language that was at once iconographically, iconographically experimental and politically potent. In positioning Nascimento in the milieu of Afro-Latinx artistic production, instead of an exclusively Brazilian context, I present his work not only through a US post-civil rights lens, but also in relation to a transnational community of Latinx artists interested in similar issues, such as anti-racism, the multiplicity of identity, redefining citizenship and nationhood, and providing access to art exhibitions and education for working class Afro-Brazilian, African-American, Afro-Latinx, and Latinx communities. I insist that Nascimento offers a major contribution to the artistic production of Latin American descendant artists in the United States and by extension, allows us to reframe debilitatingly limited categories, which Adriana talked about at length uh, earlier today. 
Dima Soto and Nascimento had similar experiences with Latin American racism and identity discourses that privilege whiteness, commonly associated with uh, associating it with wealth, success, and beauty, while simultaneously affirming the absence of racism. Their art subverted racist perceptions of national identity and belonging in the Americas, while also inscribing Afro-Latinx into the city's urban landscape to counter racial and social inequalities. They incorporated African diasporic religious symbolism into their work to protest religious intolerance and the widespread censorship and erasures of African diasporic heritage in the Americas. Their production is deeply intertwined with the histories of El Museo del Barrio, Taller Boricua, and the Caribbean Cultural Center, African Diaspora Institute, organizations that emerged in the 60s and 70s and provided space and place for Latinx artists to thrive and manifest their activism. These spaces emphasized, I believe, that migratory experiences from Latin America to the United States, whether temporary or permanent, are integral to the production of Afro-Latinx art and US identity and cultural production. By emphasizing the fluidity and the multiplicity of the artist's experiences and artistic production, I propose a definition of Afro-Latinx marked by artists' shared experiences and ideas grounded in political resistance and African diasporic religious symbolism. Nascimento arrived in New York in late 1968 before moving on to a fellowship at Wesleyan and subsequently, subsequently a tenured position at University of Buffalo, which he maintained until the mid 1980s when he returned to Brazil permanently. At Wesleyan, after experiencing Latinx and African-American activism in New York City, he focused on the flag as a, as a failed representation of nationhood and citizenship for people of African descent globally. In Shango Sobre or Shango Takes Over, he depicted the double axe, a symbol of the candomblé deity of thunder and justice. Shango's axe is painted in black and covers the length of the flag, which includes the stripes, but only four stars that float around the composition. Organized vertically, the Orisha symbol becomes a metaphor for the Afro-Brazilian body dominating the flag. By monumentalizing a deity onto the US flag and flipping it vertically, Nascimento challenged Brazil's whitening of its history and identity, as well as US involvement in this discourse and its support of the 1964 military coup in his country. Con continuing with the, his imagery about Xangô, Nascimento included a visual essay about the deity in the catalog accompanying his Taller Boricua exhibition in 1980. And this exhibition was actually in the Hersher building where El Museo is today and Marcos Dimas installed it. The layout begins with a Yoruba scepter to Shango, followed by undated figurative depictions of the Catholic Santa Barbara, which is Shango's counterpart in Afro-Brazilian religions. Finally, Nascimento includes his own painting of an abstract representation of the Orisha. He paints the inverted triangles of Shango's double axe in the upper part of the painting. The handle of the double axe becomes a complex arrangement of ge geometric shapes. The octagon at the top echoes the black power salute and could embody two conjoined fists that represent diasporic solidarity. Through his arrangement of images from different sources, Nascimento argued for the multiple and transnational nature of African diasporic deities, um, as well as definitions of diasporic identity that went beyond national delineations. It is not a coincidence that Nascimento's exhibition was organized jointly by Taller Boricua and the Caribbean Cultural Center. In order to house their activism and art practices, just one moment, I apologize. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, in order to house their activism and art practices, New Rican artists established community-based galleries such as El Musu and Taller Boricua in 1969. 
Taller Boricua affiliated artist Soto and Dimas made sculptures in the streets of East Harlem, home to one of the city's largest communities of Puerto Rican uh, migrants, and organized plein air exhibitions to make visual arts available to their underserved communities. And this is this is um, a project, my next article project, um, which in which I would like to analyze the sculptures in these pictures, um, which deeply links to uh, Serra's presentation that we just heard. Uh, so I'm looking forward to learning more um, about her work. And these images are all from Marcos Dimas's uh, private archive. In line with Nascimento, Soto's combined interest in Santeria and Taino imagery is apparent in El Matrimonio de Atabe y Shango, which was exhibited at a museo in 1979. He depicts the Taino deity Atabe, responsible for fertility and moving bodies of water, tied to Shango by a wavy line. Seated in her customary frock pose, Atabe's face resembles the one of the semi a sculpture that shares a name with the expression articulating an all-encompassing Taino spirituality and political power. Soto calls on Taino petroglyphs, such as those as the, at the Centro Ceremonial Indígena de Caguana, which include a relic of Atabe. Considered one of the most ar important archaeological sites from the pre-Columbian period, Caguana was a stop on the research visits of artists like Soto and Dimas, who traveled throughout Puerto Rico exploring Taino relics in the 1960s and 70s. And here I'm showing a um, picture of also from Marcos's um, Marcos's archive. Uh, I'm sorry, I have my baby with me and she decided not to be happy <laughs> at the right moment. Um, uh, so this is uh, an image from Marcos's uh, archive as well, which in which you could see Marcos and a, a friend who has not been identified uh, at Caguana and Soto also um, uh, researched extensively uh, at Caguana. Instead of using symmetrically curved and straight lines, Soto draws twirling shapes and zigzags, complicating the thick rounded contours of the stylized figures at Caguana. His representations of the imperfect body relate to derogatory perceptions about Taino uh, uh, art and the indigenous person. Soto wrote that he sought to examine, quote, what has survived of Africa in Puerto, in Puerto Rico and other Caribbean islands, and what these objects, artifacts, and sculptured pieces tell us about our ancestors, end quote. His drawings propose a new vision for US art of the 1970s, one that centralizes Puerto Rican indigenous culture and transnational migration. Soto related his depictions to New York City's working class urban landscape. He drew his thick twirling lines at a time when graffiti art or writing on the wall proliferated in the city's urban spaces. Young Puerto Rican men were especially active in graffiti production. Soto and Dimas became acutely aware of both graffiti's aesthetics as well as its subvertive, subversive message, which reclaimed the city's public spaces amid pervasive inequality and discrimination. In his work, Soto employs thick contours, fragmented lines, and long rounded tubular shapes to form his figures and their entourage, emulating the outlines of tags throughout the subway system. The lines position the figures metaphorically within New York City's urban fabric, as if they were sketches for graffiti on a subway car. Um, and uh, again, this is uh, these are uh, negatives that I scanned from Marcos's archive. So these are photographs he took, and he actually has a really wonderful and very large um, uh, arch, as Rodrigo knows, of archive uh, of negatives. Um, 
that has not been studied. Vanity table uh, is, um, uh, which I'm showing on the right here, and I'll show uh, another image that's a little bit less blurry, um, was made in line in, with Soto's drawings. Uh, and uh, the combination of Taino and African diasporic religious symbolism that evokes urban inequality. These ideas dominated Dimas's exhibition, The Voyager at El Museo in 1981. Composed, composed of coalesced discarded material found on East Harlem Street, the assemblages in the Voyager included the furniture of a surreal bedroom. And these works that I'm gonna show from the Voyager are mostly lost. And Musil, I think, retains one work that I'm actually not gonna talk about, but Marcos told me that uh, most of these objects were just uh, uh, unfortunately uh, lost and, and discarded. Um, following the exhibition. Vanity table fe featured found objects of yellow foam, wood, nails, a mirror, a veiny rock sourced from East Harlem or the Bronx, and a table that, he, that Dimas carved with neoclassical details. Dimas manufactured a wooden triangular base with rough foam lining the top and long nails hammered into the interior. In the exhibition, he positioned a collapsed chair in front of the table. This uncomfortable and unwelcoming arrangement undermined the vanity's purpose to leisurely gaze at oneself in the mirror. Here, the experience of looking in the mirror is interrupted by sharp nails resonating perhaps with the difficult process of forming one's identity amid per pervasive racism. Vanity Table conjures African sculptures that Dimas studied at the American Museum of Natural History and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, as well as in books. The mirror and nails recall the ones lining the surface of the Congo Niki Sinakondi, a power figure that houses mystical forces in its crevice belly, which contains a mirror to recall water and the ancestral realm. Zimas told me that he thought about the concave belly of the Nikisi and its mirror while he made Vanity Table. Vanity table gestures to the trauma of poverty, displacement, and discrimination. In the catalog for his El Museo exhibition, Dimas wrote that he created the works in the late 1960s and described them as uh, described the, the works uh, as a whole, so the of uh, as a quote, psycho-abstract work influenced by the times, soft on the outside, menacing on the inside, a turbulent character beneath a worm exterior, end quote. Grounding his practice at Taller Boricua and El Museo, havens for artists from working class backgrounds, Dimas in his vanity table expresses a position of alterity. The foam is tattered and fragmented. Despite its quote unquote soft nature, it appears rough and unfinished. Along with the nails on the inside, the sharp angle and the rigidity of the straight wooden frame reference the grit of Dimas's urban life, further emphasizing an inhospitable living space. In the center of Enmusu's gallery, Dimas placed bed, the platform um, of which is bare, but for a large axe with barbed wire plunged into uh, two pillows. Seen from the end of the bed, the sculpture resembles a ship with the axe serving as the central mast and resonates with the history of the Middle Passage. Dimas represents urban poverty as a consequence of slavery and persistent racism. The top of the protruding axe is wrapped with barbed wire that extends beyond it, creating a hostile surrounding that subverts the expectation of comfort and intimacy. Echoing imprisonment and restricted spaces and movement through the barbed wire, Dimas's work gestures to the lack of social mobility for working class New Yorkians within the art worlds and everyday life. On the left of the bed against the wall, Dimas positioned mirror, composed of two triangles that meet at the tip. It recalls Shango's double axe flipped at a 90 degree angle. Looking into the mirror, viewers would see a partial reflection of themselves as well as the bed behind them, and to the right, a peripheral view of vanity table. Because of the shape of the mirror, viewers would look either above or below them. At at their, as their eye level would be at the center of Shango's double X, blocking their reflection. Dimas created a disruption vision of the self, resonating with the fissures both of his own experience and in identity formation 
and experience of New Eurekans. Ultimately, his installation showed that the erasure of African heritage is directly linked to urban poverty, as they are both consequences of racism and discrimination, as well as their visual imagery and personal experiences. The Afro-Latinx art of Soto, Dimas, and Nascimento is relational, and I emphasize here this, the word relational, informed by migration, as well as social, racial, and political experiences that exceed national categories and are difficult to pinpoint and define. And again, I think this is something Adriana very eloquently um, discussed uh, earlier today. Ultimately, there are endless layers to the consciousnesses and identity formations illustrated in Afro-Latinx art. In addition to studying the art of settled Latinx community in the United States, we must also include circular migrants like Nascimento. Thinking of Nascimento in relation to Soto and Dimas unsettles notions that attach artistic production to place-based belonging and ethno-national concepts of identity. In the context of El Museo Taller Boricua and the Caribbean Cultural Center, Afro-Latinx art becomes an articulation of anti-racism and Afro-Latin Americanness as expressed through a post-civil rights US lens, rather than simply an ethnic categorization in our history. Um, and again, I'm so grateful for having been able to share my work today. And I also want to add that um, in thinking, in making the presentation, in writing the paper, um, I believe that the works that are lost are still part of El Musis collection, since we're talking today about La Colección. Uh, and these, the obviously the, the history and the archive that Susana and Rodrigo are, are publicizing, um, to me are part of the collection, obviously the history of the institution. Uh, so showing these works to me is talking about La Colección. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dagdashi, for a really wonderful presentation um, and a close and fascinating look at some really amazing artworks. Um, I'm going to pass it off now to um, Melissa, Melissa M. Ramos Borges, uh, art professor of art history and theory at the University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez, and Rio Pedras. Good afternoon. Um, I am delighted to be a part of this symposium and I am grateful to the Museo del Barrio team for inviting me to participate. I also want to thank those who took time to tune in via Zoom or Facebook Live. I was encouraged to present Puerto Rican avant-garde and their afterlife, which is the basis of my dissertation, Omisión o Censura, Una revisión de la vanguardia artística en Puerto Rico, 1960-1970, presented at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid in January 2020. In it, I argued that art history in Puerto Rico, produced from mid-1980s onward, consciously omitted the work of avant-garde artists of the 1960s and 1970s. This conference is loosely based on on my dissertation, and in the time allotted, I will try to correct misconceptions about avant-garde art produced on the island and remark on and make remarks on avant-garde struggles with the Puerto Rican art historical canon. Before delving into the issue at hand, I think it's best to define the term avant-garde, which was first employed by critics in local newspapers in the mid-1960s. Junk art, neodada, geometric abstraction, minimalism, hard edge, shaped canvases, conceptualism, pop, happenings, and installations were all encompassed under the term avant-garde art. I want to take a, a moment also to acknowledge Ernesto Jaime Ruiz de la Mata, William Overbay, Antonio Molina, Jesse Fernandez, Felix Bonilla Norat, Mirna Rodriguez, among other critics working at, at printed media outlets uh, for being the first chronicles of avant-garde art on the island. 
and above all, because they unwillingly, or unknowingly, excuse me, were the ones who safeguarded its, its existence. Printed media was the bulk of my references since the few Puerto Rican art publications that exist scarcely mention avant-garde art or its artists. After reviewing 20 years of island-wide circulation newspapers like El Mundo, the San Juan Star, and El Imparcial, as well as magazines such as La Revista de Instituto de Cultura Puerto Riqueña, the San Juan Review, and the and Universidad de Puerto Rico's Mayagüez Campus, the Art Review, I realized that what I had initially thought to have been a small phenomenon at the margins of the local art scene turned out to be something more complex and substantial, an ample network of connections, interconnections, exhibitions, and collaborations, which augmented the scope of the local avant-garde. Nonetheless, the hundreds of documents on the Puerto Rican avant-garde that I managed to collect from local archives have been left out of the quote-unquote official art history of the island. The exclusion that avant-garde endured in its afterlife in local art historiography can be character characterized as both censorship and omission. It could be the repercussion, excuse me, this word always uh, is difficult, could be the repercussions of the generación del 50 privileging figurative style, especially social realism, due to its ideological connotations and reaffirmation of a Puerto Rican identity, while openly rejecting avant-garde styles as a pro-independence strategy. The rejection of new styles was contrived as the myth of the artista comprometido, one of the pillars of Puerto Rican art canon, of the, of the Puerto Rican art canon, with Francisco Oyer at its inception. As the artist biographer Osiris Delgado stated, um, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna quote in Spanish, um, es bien sabido que el viejo maestro le da la espalda al impresionismo que ha ayudado a fomentar en la, en la periferia de París por urgencia de orden humano. El grito de libertad que reclama su conciencia de hombre frente a la opresión ignominiosa que atenta contra la condición humana a que percibe el artista en el Puerto Rico de entonces hace que su arte se asiente sobre la tónica de, pro, de problema social. Tuvo que regresar a Puerto Rico por imperativo de su arraigo patriótico sentimental y sus ideas libertarias, porque de eso es que se trata. End quote. Therefore, if the art canon of, of the Puerto Rican art school was being defined as dealing with Puerto Rican issues through figurative art, it is of no surprise that avant-garde conjured polemics of what was, in fact, the Puerto Rican identity. In an interview by artist turned art critic Ernesto Jaime Ruiz de la Mata to vanguard artists Carlos Girizarri and Domingo Lopez de Victoria confirmed just that when they answered the question about the public's reaction to their work. I quote, we were highly criticized though by the general public and some artists for doing art that was not Puerto Rican, end quote, stated Iris Arris. Lopez, uh, Lopez de Victoria added, quote, we are being labeled non-Puerto Ricans because of our non-figurative art, shaped canvases, hard edge style painting and constructions, end quote. There is no doubt that the colonial status of the island permeates in all matters of Puerto Rican society but it is a bit preposterous to assume that working within a certain aesthetic language makes you less or more Puerto Rican. This statement also, some, uh, this uh, idea also raises some flags. Both Irizarry and Lopez de Victoria were born in Puerto Rico, but raised in New York City. When they returned to the island in mid 1960s, their experience as, as diaspora invaded their quote unquote Puerto Ricanidad. It, is, it was therefore insinuated, insinuated that the only Puerto Rican experience was that of those living on the archipelago and of those that produce artworks pointing out its social problems. Uh, Generación del 50's ideological stance on art would later be refined and articulated by Argentinian art critic Marta Trava 
who lived and worked in Puerto Rico from 1969 to 1971. During her stay, she produced writings and conferences that laid the groundwork for her Teoría de la Resistencia, a reflection about modern art, about modern art of all the Latin America, of, of all Latin America, excuse me. It consisted it in not only it consisted not only of resisting the onslaught of the avant-garde and United States culture, but affirming a social, economic, and political difference that manifests as aesthetically. Trava's controversial 1971 Propuesta Polémica sobre Arte Puerto Riqueño became the theoretical framework that constructed a myopic discourse that would, na that would narrate the official art history of Puerto Rico, since many of its authors and curators were in fact Trava's disciples at the University of Puerto Rico in the Rio Piedras campus. Trava's text was not the only publication in the 1970s about Puerto Rican art, but it was the only one to condemn the work of avant-garde artists, calling them innocuous games. Books like Pintores eh, Contemporaneos Puerto Ricanos, Peter Block's Painting and Sculpture of the Puerto Ricans, two encyclopedias, especially Tomo Ocho of the Gran Enciclopedia de Puerto Rico, discussed avant-garde art, avant-garde avant-garde artists. Moreover, comprehensive exhibitions such as Herencia Artística de Puerto Rico, 1973, participation in international biennials, and the annual Muestra Nacional, organized by the Instituto de Cultura Puerto Riqueña, included avant-garde artists and their works. Yet, art history in Puerto Rico has been reduced to an equation of the issue of identity centered on hegemonic and homogenizing cultural values since the 80s. On rare occasions, articles, books, and curatorial, es and curatorial essays mention avant-garde artists. Yet, authors focus on discussing figurative and social content artworks, only referencing their avant-garde works as footnotes in the artist's career. The pinnacle of this practice was the book, okay, sorry, yes, was the textbook Puerto Rico Arte e Identidad edited by the Hermandad de Artistas Gráficos de Puerto Rico. The book is a collection of essays by various authors that try to trace artistic production in India in Puerto Rico from the time of the Spanish occupation to the mid 1990s. Scholars and essayists favored artists working on figurative styles and omitted those who did not fit in with the thesis put forth by the editors. This is precisely what Miriam Basilio pointed, pointed out in her essay included in the None of the Above exhibition catalog. And I quote, in the field of art history, an equation is often made between Puerto Rican art and issues of identity, assuming that this should be the primary, if not the defining act of art produced by Puerto Rican artists, end quote. Um, I would like to add to Basilio's statement that avant-garde art therefore was considered as an art, as an act of national alienation or national dismissal. Consequently, it comes at, as no surprise that in the 19th, that the 1960s and 1970s avant-garde art afterlife was confronted with deliberate omission. This is demonstrated by the fact that even though important publications of the 70s and numerous archival materials are a testimony of its existence. During the 1980s, curators and art historians faced avant-garde out. Moreover, in the classic case of out of sight, out of mind, the limited exhibition of the works preserved and conserved and preserved in public, in, in public collections in Puerto Rico, such as the Ateneo Puerto Riqueño, Universidad de Puerto Rico, Mayagüez, and Rio Piedras campuses, as well as the Instituto de Cultura Puerto Riqueña, contributes to the censorship of avant-garde art, resulting in a narrative that asserts art as a tool for the affirmation of a Puerto Rican identity. Comprehensive historiographic, historiographic or compendium exhibitions about Puerto Rican art are an extension of the discourse put forth in the in Arte e Identidad, privileging once again figurative paintings, reinforcing the notion of Puerto Rican art as one of resistance, and revealing a clear and conscious omission of avant-garde art. 
The new millennium brought forth a resurgence of avant-garde artists of the 60s and 70s, 60s and 70s, partly through Deborah Collins' work at the Museo del Barrio, organizing exhibition as the before mentioned, none of the above, Arte no es igual a vida, and the 2010 re retrospective exhibition of pioneer avant-garde artist, Rafael Ferrer. Collins' publications and exhibitions are critical commentaries on isolated or individual art Puerto Rican vanguard artists in relation to Latin America, to the Latin America or United States art scene, or with you no know, in dialogue with the Museo del Barrio's collection. On my end, the research I undertook culminated in the first comprehensive study of the avant-garde in Puerto Rico mapping out the art scene, identifying the artists, the critics, the institutions, the galleries, and discussing their controversies, their works inside it. By curating the first retrospective museum exhibition of avant-garde feminist art, uh, artist, Susi Ferrer, which we see on screen, I further challenged the antiquated paternalistic and patriarchal discourses which have omitted avant-garde women, among other marginalized groups from the Puerto Rican art history canon. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to, uh, to Melissa for that really wonderful tracing of some really important artists and exhibitions and to all of our panelists today. Um, we uh, do have time for just a couple of questions, if anyone has any that they would like to put in the Q&A. Um, and again, I think it was a really great kind of uh, larger conversation. To, it's, it's the start of a really great larger conversation about you know, these larger networks, these artists, these artworks, and we're really excited to be having that. Um, so I, Again, encourage anyone to put anything in the Q and A. Um, and we are going to um, end with Pepon uh, Osorio's presentation in just a little bit. Um, I was really interested in how um, any of the panelists are welcome to, to respond in how many of the presentations came back to this kind of um, making physical questions of uh, movement, of identity, of community. Um, and I know you've each talked a lot about that and about how those kind of uh, come up a lot in the work art you're working at with. Um, but I invite anyone to respond to that a little more that you didn't have time for your presentation. I'm sorry, Lee, could you repeat the question? My internet kind of came out a little bit, I'm sorry. Um, I was interested in how many of the presentations came back to the idea of making physical or visible, very intangible questions of movement, of identity, of community. Um, you all talked about that, some in your presentations, but I invited, I wanted to invite you to talk about that even more um, if there's more that didn't fit into your original presentation. Uh, I see Adriana has a hand up. <laughs> Should I go ahead? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Ramos Borges for your talk. Um, I'm asking the question live because I can't seem to type in the Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> so my question for you, um, I'm trying to formulate it, but I, I actually had two questions and you can choose which one to answer or ignore them both. Um, I, I noticed that I've never heard of Susie Ferrer, so thank you so much for introducing me to artists I've never heard of. Um, fascinating. Um, and of course, I saw the early image that you showed of Zilia Sanchez. So I was curious about your perspective on the recent attention that Zelia Sanchez has gotten, which I think is part of a phenomena of focusing attention on geometric abstract women artists who are late in life. So that's one question. But my other question was also about um, the ways that, you know, someone like Carlos Irizarry um, was included, for example, in the exhibition uh, MoMA at El Museo um, and framed as a Latin American artist. 
um, as were others like Felix Gonzalez Torres, Rana Mendieta, or even Juan Sanchez. Um, but I'm interested in your perspective um, of this debate between whether these um, transnational Puerto Rican artists, you know, what happens when we think about them as part of the diaspora stateside versus what happens when they're framed as part of a Latin American canon? Um, not that well formed, but maybe you can see where I'm sort of coming from. Um, eh, first of all, that's a very loaded question. <laughs> and I, I don't know if I could answer it, eh, eh, like, eh, abordar todo lo que, lo que me estás preguntando. Um, what I always go back to with the issue of identity is how the artists consider themselves. So for me, issues about how other people label them um, or how other people talk about or try to um, catalog them is, is it's definitely problematic thinking about how the artists consider themselves. So, um, from what I know and from what I talked with Carlos prior to his death, obviously he considered himself Puerto Rican. Even though in the 50s he was, or in the 60s he was included, I have the book somewhere around here, and 40 Latin American artists living in New York. And I think that was the spaces that they were permitted to be at. I don't think there still was a really like a formulated a consciousness of a Puerto Rican identity as an artist in the States or in New York. Um, but I am delving into that issue because I will be um, presenting an essay for the Latinx uh, publication. So that is the issue that I will be particularly investigating about these avant-garde artists that were these by veins, no? Uh, Carlos, both Carlos and Domingo Lopez de Victoria were constantly coming in and out of the city. So how did that affect from the city and from Puerto Rico? And how were they seen within the New York art scene, within the Puerto Rican diasporic art scene and within the Puerto Rican archipelago art scene? I think it's, that's gonna be the moment I can answer fully that question. <laughs> and regarding Celia's um, um, recognition, I mean, for us that have been living in the island, everybody knows Celia, everybody is aware of her uh, um, long career, and it's very, um, it's very rewarding to see that she's finally being seen outside Puerto Rico. But there's also things que que tomarlo con pinza, no? And just see if it's all part of a fad or if it's going to be something that it will truly be more más longevo, no? That's not just something that goes in and out fast. I'm sorry, I get a little bit nervous when answering in questions in English because I think of the answers in Spanish and I'm trying to, you know, switch code there. But I hope, hopefully, I answered some of the questions. Absolutely, thank you. No worries. Gracias. Okay. Well, not like it's not my time to say anything, but I just want to also mention something in terms of Zile Sanchez, who's an artist that I really didn't know 10 years ago, and I included in the show in Brazil in 2014. And I think it's part of uh, gallery work that her work is more uh, widely uh, known and recognized now. And I think this is, you know, sometimes has to be part of the conversation you know, that there is a lack of uh, Latinx, Puerto Rican artists, uh, Latinx, I think more in the marketplace, you no? Know? So I mean, this, this is something that, uh, yeah, that I, I really think is Galerie Le Long's a big merit in terms of like a more global recognition to La Maestra Sanchez's work. Just wanna like chime in quick. I wanna be mindful of time. I know um, people are starting to have to log off, but I wanted to uh, give Sarda a chance to wrap up this really wonderful panel as you started it. If you have anything else you wanted to add to the conversation or um, any other questions you wanted to bring up. You're asking me for me. If you, if you okay. have anything else that you wanted to make sure made it into the conversation. Um, I think as far as a lot of the points that Ad Adriana was bringing up, um, 
as far as sort of like what are the limits I'm thinking a lot about the limits of visibility too and sort of the mm -hmm. politics of representation I think that's sort of where this and foco talk um, is coming from um, and that sort of the larger project for me um, thinking about New York and photography in the in the 70s and 80s is about claiming this Puerto Rican experience of coloniality as sort of endemic to to what U.S. art and um, you know visual culture visuality um, is about versus this sort of like corrective through the discourse uh, of inclusivism as we've you know been talking about throughout the um, the day. So I would just add that. Well, thank you all again so much for a really wonderful panel. Um, this is just the beginning of what we hope to be a long and fruitful and exciting conversation. And we invite everyone to come back and take part in that, um, including in putting the dates of the permanent collection exhibition on your calendar now, which should be opening um, in, Mar in May of next year. And we'll, we're all very excited. And there will be many more, again, conversations leading up to that. Um, but I want to invite Pepon Osorio to lead us out of this wonderful afternoon, this wonderful conversation. Uh, many of you know Pepon Osorio as a fantastic and beloved artist. He is uh, also a uh, professor of community art at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture and a longtime friend and colleague and beloved associate of El Museo del Barrio. So passing it over to you, Pepon. Thank you again, everyone. Hi, hi everyone. Um, can you see me? I, I'm not sure. We can, can hear you. you. We can hear you. We can't see you yet. Oh, okay. Oh, we can oh, see. Oh, there you. I am. Hi. Um, I will be quick because I know I'm competing with everyone's dinner, so um, I'm just going to move right into it. I just wanted to thank El Museo for the invitation, and um, it's very curious that as, as El Museo is digging into their collection. I'm, I am also um, excavating into my archives. And I thought it was proper to look into, into um, few um, uh, videos and um, because I was curious about where I've been and trying to revisit the urgencies of those early days. So that's, that's what brought me into uh, in looking into the archives. And, I, and um, guess what? What I pulled out which is um, uh, Con Todos los Hierros, um, which was an, uh, uh, an exhibition um, in the late, in the early 90s um, at El Museo del Barrio. So I mostly will talk about that and um, a couple of other things, but I just wanted to um, start um, saying that I became an artist in residence for El Museo del Barrio in the late 80s um, at the invitation of El Museo director back then, Petra Barrera. So with the end of the residency, Susana Torroya Leval, the then curator, began a dialogue about a possible retrospective of my work, um, which of course freaked me out. I, I, I come from a generation of people that save the best jokes for the wake, so bear with me. And I totally freaked out because I thought that something, something had happened to me and something, and Susana knew something about it that I didn't know, because usually I always equated um, retrospective with the end of the career. And this was really, really the beginning of my career. Um, at that time, my practice was an, an intersection of experimental performance and visual arts. Um, it, is obviously, it is obvious that the, the theatricalization in my work comes from many years of collaborating with Merian Soto and my background as a caseworker in the uh, Bureau of Child Welfare. Wanted to show you a little bit of the, of the, um, of the, in, uh, the exhibition that began with this idea, of, I have to, oh, give me one second. What did I do with it? I have to share, um, there you go, share the screen. There you go. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay, it's all kinds of things. But what I really wanted to do with this exhibition after a while, I just began to think that um, there were two, the two parallel um, um, equations that were going at, this, at, the, at the same time. I was reluctant to the invitation because for five years, I had been under the radar when it comes to exhibitions. I had a bad encounter um, at a mainstream museum 
with what I think was the artist Christian Boltanski. And the work on view, it was at, at um, MoMA. And that led me to decline exhibition invitations. And I was very much um, uh, removed from the exhibition space to the point that I was not even included in the decade show. Um, I just wanted to show you also because I thought that the uh, retrospective would be put, put an end to my record and I was still figuring it out my practice. There were two things that helped me to um, accept the invitation um, opportunity. For Latinx, it was rare to have an exhibition at that time. And this exhibition became for me like kind of a time capsule. And so I thought under those circumstances, I was going to do it. But I have never, I come from a working class and, and my experience still up until today, it's one of an ease with um, museums and exhibitions. So what I've asked um, Susana Torruella was to um, allow me to transform the museum into a space that it was hospitable, into a space of neutral ground. And so when you come into the exhibition at the very, very beginning, you see this um, uh, a song, this popular song, Plena, by um, Joselino Oppenheimer, who was a Puerto Rican, that said, so much vanity, so much hypocrisy. After all, you work, uh, your body after death belongs to the um, cold grave. And so that in contradiction with the work, but also uh, at the same time, looking at the work and reminding ourselves um, of, of this, I'm just gonna show you what the installation. So you, this was at the very entrance door you, the, of the old museum. You open the door and you enter into the uh, exhibition. I was very curious. Let me see if I can move forward. Oh, don't tell me the same thing happened. Ah, I hate this. Same thing happened that happened before. Oh no, here it is. Okay. Sorry about that. There you go. And so um, a lot of the elements of the pieces that were there, this exhibition actually compiles um, uh, mostly theatrical sets that were done um, with, in collaboration with Median. Um, they were the first time shown um, at El Museo del Barrio and, um, and it was a, a, some sort of a retrospective of all, of all this work that, um, that came about. On, on those trees, what you see, it's a diary. I started to write about a, um, um, continuously on these diaries every time I went to the studio and each leaf has a word that if you look at it as a composition of my diary all put together. The chandelier was also used in another um, installation, I mean, in another um, set for, for um, the work and so was the sofa. I was interested in actually um, um, using the performance space, the theatrical uh, theater space um, as, a, as a ground for, for installations. Let me stop sharing and I'm just gonna move on to the next. Um, oh, I was told that I need to share again. Okay, there you go. Share. So the grounds for this um, um, exhibition I've asked for retrospective about Susana, that I wanted the entire museum staff to work um, and come together as a way, not only to understand the retrospective conceptually, but also hands-on. And so a lot of people from, the, from El Museo came in and, um, and participated in the project and everyone had a, a specific, um, Everyone had a very specific um, instruction. There you go, that's Susana, that's Marian Soto. And I don't have um, a photograph, I mean, a video of people uh, from the community that also came. I am interested in uh, using people's expertise um, into the process. So a lot of um, people came who were florist and um, also florist and also, um, um, carpenters and a uh, few other things. As a curator, curator Susana um, Leval had a way of uh, compromising and discuss every single aspect of the exhibition. 
designer uh, decisions were always a happy medium. Mira and Susana's way of curating um, was the only way to approach this exhibition. We involve every staff member um, and offer the opportunity to understand the work, not only conceptually, as I said before, but hands-on. And I'm just gonna move on to the next one. This is a quite, quite a, a wonderful thing because I, I don't do floor plans. I don't do my cat for the exhibition. So we were working on the site and um, this very specific piece, El Velorio, which is interestingly enough inspired somehow by Francisco Oyer that was mentioned earlier. Um, it was a piece that recreated um, uh, a uh, funeral home. Uh, and it had to do with um, AIDS in the Latino community right there in, in um, El Barrio. And I was uh, mostly curious as to one day seeing you know, healthy people walking around the streets and within a month seeing their body decaying. And I, was, I became very, very worried about that. So the installation was basically a recreation of a funeral home with many caskets and you will see later. And, um, and it was created by the staff at the Museo del Barrio together with members of the community. Wanted to show you a piece. Uh, oh, I have to log out and log back in. Sorry about that. Um, back in, share. There you go. So this is just gonna give you a, a sort of like an overview of the installation after it was completed. And I'm gonna hurry up a little bit and show you. There you go. Body bags, flower arrangements made my, by members of the community, the floor. Susanna mentioned that my work is unconventional and um, she also talks a little bit about the um, unusual um, aspects of the installation. I am interested in creating spaces that are somehow redundant and obvious in the community. And I'm interested in creating those places, obviously altering those spaces as a way of reflecting, as a way of um, contemplating life outside of its natural environment. And pla when placed in the museum, it's some sort of like a, a landscape of memory of, of um, interpretations and ways that they've seen it before. I'm just gonna stop this. I think you probably got a good sense of, the, um, of that. I have to stop sharing. I have to share again. And I'm going to show you the last of what I mean by unconventionality. These are the, um, so you can possibly imagine what it's like to go into a funeral home, which I went to many of them, and begin to convince that I'm an artist and that I, um, and that I was making a piece about a funeral home. And that was very challenging. And um, at the same time, that it was very rewarding because I finally convinced the guys to come over. And so here it is in front of the museum and they bring in the caskets in and the community is witnessing caskets being brought, ex um, uh, 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 brought in into, into the museum. So there was this kind of a conflict because people were trying to wonder what was the place of these um, caskets in, in, in the context of, of a museum. And I think that I often um, am also interested in that, in finding the, the place for cultural expressions and cultural, um, popular culture in the context of uh, museum exhibitions. I often translate ideas and um, those ideas, the process, it, um, the, the exhibition itself is a debris of the process. And all these um, imageries um, sometimes become a metaphor for the work that I wanted to do. Uh, my engagement with the Museo del Barrio was a training ground and a place where unconditional support was provided to me. And that experience allowed me to recontextualize the exhibition experience 
and continue to translate stories of real people in real circumstances. So you can imagine what this is all about. And um, I, I wanted to leave it here and, um, and begin to, um, if there is any questions, I will be happy to respond. It was a little choppy, sorry about that, but. Oh, now I'm not listening. Pepon, it was wonderful. I don't know if you, you we're seeing your screen. I just want to let you know if you want Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, 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 that's not good. <laughs> but I have to share, you know, as I, um, you know, you, we had a little preview. Oh my God. You were going to share earlier. Um, and it's really, um, it's really beautiful because so much of what you're showing is, is still what goes on today. And just to, to share a little anecdote, we were loading in for our next installation and uh, we had the same experience of community members coming and um, trying to help us move things into the, the gallery. So, so nothing really changes, I guess. Right. Well, the, the sad the sad thing about all this, it's just that I can put the retrospective again in a museum and it will probably have the exact same effect. Um, and and I, I just put a, 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 a recent um, installation batch of honor in, in a museum. And um, the only thing that has changed with that with that installation, it was it wasn't so much about the father and son. Uh, it's an installation where the father and son talk to each other. But it was really about the uh, institutional and how the, the systematic and um, uh, practices of institutions are now under the, under the um, uh, microscope as opposed to individuals itself. That's the only thing, but you know, the, the story of Badge of Honor, the story of the scene of a crime and all these installations that I created, you know, the issues remain exactly the same. Yeah, no, and I want to thank you so much for sharing these images with us. It was really wonderful seeing uh, the preparation for the exhibition and that sort of communal communal uh, spirit. And uh, I didn't know much about this piece. And uh, for me, there's also, there's also like this kind of interesting parallel between opening an exhibition and, and holding a funeral, no? I think that's... Uh, the energy sort of dies out when the show is completed. Uh, right. And, I mean, I couldn't help uh, thinking about that while I was uh, seeing your images. And right. uh, also love, you know, like the, what year is that again, 88? Uh, no, 91. 91, yeah. 91, I started the residency in the late 80s. Yeah. Um, it yeah. was 91. Actually, by the way, I, I we were not ready for the response of that that people had to that exhibition, and so when I in in uh, the exhibition was divided in half, half of it was life, and the other one was death. I don't know if we called it the F stop gallery, which was all the way in the back of El Museo, and um, and it was really interesting because the entire opening reception I spent it dancing with a band that it was in the hallway and consoling people at the installation of um, uh, El Velorio and bringing water and Kleenex to people at El Velorio. And it was one of those moments that I realized that all these things was merging at the same time and that people also were able to pay um, homage to their loved ones that they've lost through the um, epidemic. But at the same time, the, the, the music was some, somehow therapeutic. You know, the music was somehow a way of releasing a lot of energy that was going on. So it, it, in that sense was um, quite an interesting, but I, but, but I was definitely unprepared. I, I, I learned my big lesson. What happens after this exhibition at El Museo del Barrio is that, I, that then I became um, sort of like, um, uh, uh, people were intrigued by the work and I was asked to do a lot of um, um, commissions. And, um, I, there was one in which uh, a large uh, photograph of, of, of my installation at, at, at this show in New York City um, came up in the New York Times. And um, it was a, sort of like a, like, a, like a pivotal moment for me because I took the New York Times and I went to the person that I know that worked with me in the installation and I knocked and I said, hey, Luisa, look, we made it to the New York Times. And then Luisa turned around and she said to me, what the hell is the New York Times? 
And so to me, well, it was like an awakening that I was creating work with and in collaboration with people in the community, yet the community did not know um, uh, the, the, the consequences of it. So as a result of that, I, I came back to, the, um, to my practice and I asked every museum, even today, that before entering into the museum, the work has to be seen in a community context. The work has to be seen in a storefront. So that was a practice that I learned from there. But also as you get more and more offerings, you forget somehow somewhere, you need to remind yourself of the space and the place that supported you and came from. And so that, that was an example of it. And, and, and another thing, and I'll be really, really quick, but another thing that drives me crazy these days is going to museums, mainstream museums, and seeing bilingual signage, you know? And um, in, in the, for the sake of inclusivity, uh, most uh, mainstream museums are interested in, um, in getting credit for that. Little did they know that our institutions, our places of the Latinx um, um, institutions have been doing this out of urgency and also out of necessity. And, but it really drives me crazy that I go into all these main, main, mainstream museums and I see things in Spanish and English as if they invented that, you know? Um, so I think that in Museo and a couple of, and, and older, um, uh, it's great that you're looking into the, into the uh, collection. It's also great that you're looking into the past practices. And I hear, um, I was listening to the other panelists. It's, it's really wonderful because I think that we need to begin to credit ourselves as we see older mainstream institutions getting credit. I'm sorry, I talked too much. Ah, but, but what, a, what a great way to finish. I'm sorry. This is like a fantastic, I think, conclusion to you know uh, everything we've been uh, working on together throughout the day and in before, and that we'll continue to uh, work uh, towards. Uh, so. Yeah. I, I think if there's not other questions, I think we should uh, end our session today. And thank I you for the opportunity. I would like to thank you so much to uh, Pepon. Uh, so on point, agreed. Um, everybody that joined us today, every single panelist, um, quick reminder about, um, we have three shows open on the 27th. Uh, of October at El Museo, uh, Juan Francisco Elso por America, uh, Renier Levanovo Matuzala, and Domestic Annex. Uh, so please come visit our shows, uh, visit our virtual spaces. Uh, YouTube channel uh, El Museo is uh, very humbled and grateful for your attendance and participation today. So uh, thank you, and I see you next time. And big thanks to Lee for all the organizing. Yes, thanks all.